folks here. So let's see. So Richard, maybe you can kick us off. If you tell us where you're dialing in from and, and anything else you want to share with us before we get started. Hey, so thank you so much for doing this, Billy. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Richard. I'm uh, um, Upper West Side of uh, New York, uh, ex London, but been uh, been here for uh, long enough that I can almost call myself a New Yorker. Very nice. Uh, Mallory, do you want to say hello? Uh, where you're dialing in from? Yeah, sorry. I'm just finishing my lunch. Um, oh. I'm. What do you mean? I'm in Michigan, Detroit. Oh, nice. No, yeah, just where you're dialing in from and, and anything okay. else you want to share before we get started, just to say hi. Yep. Um, no, I just, I'm just taking over because Jason, unfortunately, couldn't be here, but I love trying all these new scotches, so I'm excited to see what these ones are all about. Yeah, and there's a, for everybody here, there's a few different universes coming together. There's some Facebook groups here uh, that we've all kind of met virtually. There's a lot of folks here in New York who we know like kind of in person uh, through different clubs and whatnot. And then there's like another kind of like random circles of friends that are, you know, some of them might be new to whiskey and, and some aren't. Um, Harold, do you want to say hello? Hey, my name's Harold. I'm dialing in three. Is the sound off? Yeah. They can hear you through mine. Yeah. There we go. There we go. Oh, that's about it. Yeah, I can't hear you at all. <laughs> okay, now say it. <laughs> Testing. <Okay>. Disqualified. <laughs> okay. All right, moving on. Okay. Uh, hey, Peter. Peter Willems. Uh, Peter, do you want to say hello and where you're dialing in from? Uh, hey, James. And I, I recognize a few of the names here, people that I've communicated with in some way, shape, or form. A lot of new faces, too. Was that Harold? I think so. Can you hear me, James? Are you muted or am I muted? I think I'm okay, muted. I'll, I'll just stay unmuted. Muted. Okay, go. Yeah. Say whatever you're going to say. Uh, I'm coming to camera. <laughs> hey, Peter. Hey. Why aren't I you pouring my samples right now? <laughs> yeah, that's. Oh, they're already poured. They're coming your way somewhere tomorrow. You. Thank you. <laughs> uh, dialing in from Dallas, James. Very nice. Good to see you, Peter. You too. Uh, yeah, Harold was sitting two feet away. You could have just come over. <laughs> all right. All good. Uh, Matt Lauren, I know some of you saw Matt early. Matt's here somewhere. Matt, do you want to say hello? Hi, I'm on the terrace. You know, that's where they, they made the smoking section. So doing a little cigar with this in Brooklyn as well, but from Long Island and looking forward to today. Happy to be part. Thank you. And I'm sure our, our, our guest host, Billy, will tell us why Matt's wearing three glasses here in a moment. Uh, Nathan Twiney. Hey, Nathan. Really Everybody nice isn't? Wait, what's going on? <laughs> Nathan, you want to say hello, where you're dialing in from? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm dialing in all the way here on the West Coast up in uh, Bellingham, Washington. So I'm having a brunch drum with all you. Nice. And, and Nathan's another, you know, Facebook friend. We're all kind of meeting each other, maybe by face for the first time, second time. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Eric Muldrum. Hey, Eric. Hey guys, um, so um, I'm calling from the West Coast as well, San Diego area, um, and uh, you know I'm in I'm in, a, I'm in a bunch of Facebook groups, but um, you know um, I'm very glad to be part of this. Thank you for joining, Eric. Yep, thanks. Uh, I think that's everyone that's here. I know there's a lot of people that are on their way back home or from another brunch or something, so uh, we'll add them in and, and make or make them embarrassed when they join to say something funny. So thank you all for joining. This is the second tasting we've done as a, a group that we call Pure Malts. First one we did was a teen inch set of 16 drams. So any of you that came to that, you know, this is going to be a lot different, much more relaxed. There's five drams. You all have those. We all got those out to you last week. Um, just in case anybody's joining, if this is like your first, second, third time of a tasting, try to get a, any type of glasses, at least two or three that you can you know, kind of wash out as we go on that has a tapered mouth. If you don't have any glasses like this or a, or a Glencairn, like a white wine glass, and then worst case, just a tumbler, just something that just helps the nose because we're going to be nosing these quite a bit. Um, this is going to be fully interactive. So join, you don't have to put your question in the chat unless you really want to. Feel free to jump in. There's not going to be a lot of us here. So you can ask anything that you want. Um, and then we are recording this. We'll put that up later. So if you miss anything, you'll be able to watch it later and get to that. 
So that was all the housekeeping. So thank you for joining. My name is James Walton. I'm dialing in from New York City as well. Um, I've met most of you through different ways. So thank you for, for joining us here and participating. It's going to be a lot of fun. Um, I have the pleasure to introduce our guest, um, Billy Abbott. He is um, a author, a whiskey enthusiast, and he leads many initiatives at the Whiskey Exchange. A lot of us whiskey nerds probably knows everything that I just said, and some of us here probably have no idea what I just said. So we're going to get into all of that, as well as getting to, into these really great five whiskeys. Um, all were specially bottled for the Whiskey Show 2021, which I don't think probably any of us got the chance to go, but I guess we'll find that out too. So Billy, I'll hand it over to you. Billy's going to be our guide, our evangelist. He's going to tell us all about these drams and everything else going on in this world. Billy? Oh, hello, everybody. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm dialing in from the, the, the wonders of, as you can see, the brutally sunny London. Uh, the moon is almost full today. Yeah. Anyway, it's, um, it's only 7, 7 p.m. here, so I'm perfect timing for me to start having a dram. Thank you for choosing a good time. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, a, as, as James was saying, I'm a, I'm a writer. I am now officially allowed to call myself an author because I have a book, uh, which is very exciting. Um, but uh, I've been a writer for about the last 10 years working for the Whiskey Exchange and as a freelancer. I, I used to be a computer programmer working in the wonders of finance. And I used to work up in uh, Stanford and uh, Norwalk, Connecticut quite a lot for anybody in New York who knows of those wonderful, wonderful places. Um, but I've been out of the, uh, the game for 10 years now and just focusing on talking to people and writing about booze, especially whiskey. That's my, my main thing. Uh, but the, the five whiskies we have tonight, the reason why I'm, I'm, I'm here talking to you from over here, um, is these are all bottled for the whiskey show, or as we now call it, whiskey show without a the. It was a very strange meeting where we decided to remove the the from whiskey show. But anyway, moving on. Um, whiskey show is at our yearly festival. So the Whiskey Exchange, if you don't know of us, we are um, the world's largest specialist retailer of spirits, online retailer of spirits. Uh, big website, thewhiskeyexchange.com. Uh, we also have three shops here in London. Um, and our latest big news is that last month we were acquired by Pernod Ricard. But ignore that for now. Ignore the, the, the fun news that we're now owned by a big French company. But anyway, um, we're a big sort of family-owned retailer. Um, been around for about 20-some years. I'm just trying to remember if I've got that in the quiz later on, so I'll be quiet. 20-some years. Um, founded by uh, a couple of brothers and... We sell booze. Um, Sekinda, um, the older of the two brothers, is a whiskey collector, and so we've always focused on whiskey. He's now building a distillery on Isla and doing other stuff, but um, in the end, it's all about choosing great drinks. And so at our whiskey show that we do every year, we get together, um, like, I think normally get together about 100 exhibitors. We have about a 1,000-ish uh, whiskeys. Remember that number for later. Um, and we basically do a two-day festival. This year, we did a three-day festival. Uh, we expanded it because after a year of nobody seeing each other, we thought, eh, we should probably make it a little bit longer. Um, and it was two and a half days of absolute carnage uh, and fun. Um, they locked me basically in a basement. I did talks for two and a half days in the dark. It was quite nice, but uh, you got to drink a lot of nice whiskey. But every year for the show, we bottle a series of whiskeys, and we have all five of them here today. There's actually two different sort of sets of the whiskeys, and we're going to start off with a Ben Nevis, uh, which is sort of stands alone slightly, and it's a celebratory whiskey, just to celebrate the uh, the fact that we're back, basically. Yeah, you know, after a year of uh, being away and doing other stuff, which I'll talk about later on, uh, we're back. We're back in person. We're back seeing people again over here in the UK. So we bottle the whiskey, especially for that. And then we have another four whiskeys, which are a series, because every year we come up with a new theme. And our creative director, a guy called uh, Raj Chafter, uh, who's also going by his, uh, his old graffiti tagging name these days of Mr. C. Um, he has, a, he has a, a legal past in there somewhere that he keeps on hinting at. Um, but he uh, puts together a concept and creates an you know, interesting set of whiskey labels to go along with some fantastic drams. So I'll talk about the whiskeys and we'll talk about the drams. And if, if you guys have any questions at all about the wonderful world of whiskey, what we're drinking, other things let me know as you can probably tell i quite like talking um and can talk for probably significantly longer than i should do so jump in if you have any questions cut me off ask things 
and all that sort of business. Billy, I saw a lot of eyebrows raised. It sounds like you might have some trivia questions or things that we might need to be very careful and listen in on as you go. Well, I, 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 I may I may have a few things for us, you know, small quiz type situation for the end of the uh, end of the tasting, you know, a pair, yeah. Um, so nobody gets shit faced until after the trip. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> We're doing a whiskey tasting. We're not doing shots yet. That's later. All right. So, so we had one person just join. Olaf, do you want to say hello real quick and where you're dialing in from? Sure. Sorry for running late. Traffic was killer. I'm on the Lower East Side, Manhattan. Uh, excited to be here and try these whiskeys. Hello. Oh. Excellent. Um, yeah, cool. So we should probably, you know, this first whiskey that uh, I can see James whirling around in his glass frantically in a sort of need to drink whiskey kind of way. Although I say it's, it's two in the afternoon for you guys, you know, it, it's, it's half past seven here for me. I'm, I'm very much in need of a dram. So this first whiskey, which is on the, the, the bottle cam around as well as uh, in my hand, um, this is a 25 round. So this label, it was just literally a this is whiskey show. This is our branding for this year. This is a celebration that we're back. So last year, due to all of this, we didn't do an in-person show. So our first show, we haven't done in person for a long time. Uh, the show's been going for more than a decade now. And so we decided last year to move it all online. And so we ended up doing a nine day um, online festival during which uh, the Whiskey Exchange only talks. We did 75 hours worth of talks. Um, I did 20 odd. I think I did 26 hours of talks in the end, 26 talks. Uh, my colleague Dawn did 30. Uh, we got Dave Broom in to do like another 15 hours worth and we filled in gaps, a load of other folks. But yeah, 75 hours just from us. I think we ended up with more than 450 hours of talks and tastings. And as we were discussing earlier on, tours of Chichibu over in Japan, like, you know, we had everything for all over the world. But this year we decided we need to get back in person and, um, yeah, the, the party on the Saturday night for the exhibitors demonstrated that, yes, we did definitely need to get back in person. There was a lot of drinking. But um, alongside it, we also ran a virtual show. And so this is our celebration of not only being back, but really sort of pushing forward whiskey shows. You know, lots of folks went virtual during lockdown um, and we really lent into it and created, in my opinion, the best show we've ever done. And we didn't even see anybody. And this year took that, combined it with the in-person show and did this blended situation where we sent out packs, you know, people tasting along with the people in the room. And it's incredible. Anyway, Whiskey Show is back. It will be back next year. Um, and hopefully we'll have all the videos from this year show up soon if you want to taste along. Um, but this whiskey, very much a celebratory whiskey. It's a 25-year-old Ben Nevis. Um, first things, is anybody here tried a ben nevis 96 before yep some nodding nodding heads yeah so ben nevis 96 has a bit of a reputation um and i think if you stick your nose in the glass you'll discover that it's actually a, a fairly worthwhile reputation um we don't entirely know what it is about 1996 specifically 95 97 both great years both do you know great ben nevis whiskies you can find them but 96 seems to be this peak of fruitiness and over the past few years, it's been developing in cast still. I think it's starting to get towards the edge of, for a lot of the casks, they're starting to get just to the edge of where they need to be. Um, I've tasted a couple that have gone too witty. This one is not one of those. And you stick your nose in the glass and have a smell. It's just all fruit. And that is, it's a style of whiskey, which I love. Uh, and I know also that my boss loves. And so when they're sitting down trying to decide what to pull out, they pulled out the other four whiskies as like this is a series this makes sense of the series that we're doing this one was very much a case of the boss then went i think i want a ben nevis as well and the reason being is that he wanted to drink some ben nevis and it's a lot easier if he just gets it bottled for something then he doesn't need to you know go and find some car samples it's just literally can buy himself a case of his own whiskey um this there was very little of it it's about 100 bottles we sold it at the show, like a little allocation each day, sold a few bottles online. So well done for you guys for jumping on those. Um, this is the first thing that sold out every day. We had a little, uh, we had a queue out the front of the show. And um, this is tradition of people turning up really early and then getting in the queue early and drinking in the queue with their friends and sort of like swapping samples and things like that. And it's really, really good fun. Um, 
the record we've had so far for an 11.30 start was someone turning up at six o'clock in the morning. Um, that was the year we had a Curra's Hour on sale, so that's a bit different. But this year, you know, the people turn up early, sitting around having fun. The second the doors opened on the first day, um, there was a stampede. And it looked like something, you know, like a, a Black Friday in a, in a Costco or something. It was just this ridiculous, just people running through, trying to vault stands and things like that. We, uh, we had to fix things the next day because they were trying to sort of, you know, they broke things, knocked things out of the way, trying to get in to get themselves a bottle of, specifically, this. Because we only had a tiny allocation each day, you know, like 20 some bottles. Um, yeah, it was quite weird. I was just standing there having a chat with a friend of mine, not realizing that we were about to start. And then all of a sudden the doors open and these people just go boom, straight down the middle of the, uh, the hallway, um, running through stands, trying to find the best route. So running over the top of the you know, more immersive stands. And so, yeah, I know who they were. I, yeah, I'll I wasn't there. Don't blame me. I'm not blaming you this time. Anyway, nah, that's much more sensible. Yeah, Billy, what type he, of, he gets uh, other people to do the running. What type of cask is this? Can you share? So, um, for all of these, um, all the others, they're 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 nice and easy. They're, they're all sort of like you know sherry cask or refill cask. This one, I don't know. Um, one of the problems I have is that they don't tell me if they don't want people to know because they know if they do tell me and tell me not to tell people, I will still tell them. So this one has been hidden away from me. I'm fairly certain this is um, a refill sherry. Refill sherry hogshead fits right for me. Um, I know we've had a load of these in the past. Um, but yeah, there's, it could be one of the ones we don't know ourselves. Uh, this is one of the things you discover fairly quickly after starting to work in the independent bottling business is that people say, oh, what's the cask? And you go, it's made of oak. And they go, well, surely you can say more than that. It's like, nope, not really. I've seen it. And I'm not entirely certain what size it is because I didn't get to actually touch it personally. You know, there's, there's a lot of um, records that aren't really kept properly. Increasingly now they are, but 25 years ago? Yeah. That was not a time where the people really cared so much. In 96, it was around the sort of time people started computerizing. And Ben Nevis is a little bit of a sad distillery. I don't know if any, has anybody been to Ben Nevis? Yeah. You got um, one here at least. I got one. Cool. Because yeah. I've not. I've just heard tales of woe, of it being falling down and being a little bit sad. And you go to the gift shop and you go, oh, dearie me, I don't want to buy any of this. Kind of stuck in time, too. Yeah. It's just, it's out of time. But they, uh, the distillery manager passed away recently and they've got a new guy in there now from Japan who is trying to modernize a bit. Uh, but their whiskey is still fantastic, but it's just very, very old fashioned. And when you go there, I've just been told it's actually you know almost distressing. She walk around going, how are they making such fantastic whiskey where nobody seems to look after the place? You, you know, dodge bits of falling ceiling and that sort of thing. But no, 25 years in the cask have really allowed this to develop. They start off pretty fruity, these ones. And over the last five years or so, since we've seen them coming out, they've really got this reputation as being fruit bombs. I've got, um, unfortunately, I don't know the cask number for this one. They've hidden that away from me as well. Um, I've got friends of mine who collect very specifically different cask number series. You know, they, they know when they were filled, they, they have lists, they've spoken to the distillery manager and know which numbers were available at which times. It's got a bit scary and analytical on these because they are so popular. For, the, for those here that are really into whiskey, I think our minds just got blown into like, there's a whole other deeper rabbit hole <laughs> to go down when you start tracking oh, tests. Oh, there, there, there really is. You know, I've got a friend of mine who, when I announced the, to a little group of friends of mine, said, oh, we've got Ben Nevis coming soon. And immediately this guy, Olivier, popped up and went, is one of the seven four series? Is one of the seven four nines? Because I, I, I like the seven four nines better than seven four eight is pretty good. And yeah, it just gets yeah proper scary when you start doing that. You know, we uh, we don't always give out what the cast numbers are because we don't always know. But um, when we can do, we do these days just because we now know people are keeping such ridiculous levels of records on these. Um, yeah, but this is. Uh, Sorry. If anybody has any tasting notes, uh, nosing notes, um, questions, jump in. Feel free. Um, yeah, I had a question. Billy, was um, there wasn't that many bottles from uh, of this. Was that because it, the cask wasn't uh, wasn't very full when it was uh, uh, bottled, or was do you think some of it was split uh, and bottled separately? Now, this was just a cast which wasn't, wasn't very full, wasn't a split. Um, okay. This was specifically, I think the reason we chose this in the end as the fifth bottle for the whiskey show was because 
it wasn't a huge cask. It was a one we can do just a little special release just to celebrate the whiskey show. Um, if we did it as a bigger sort of release, as a, a major one, we probably won't lay more. And um, we did a sister cask of this um, about two, three weeks ago. Um, three weeks ago, beginning of November. Yeah, that lasted about 10 minutes online. Yeah, for an entire, I, I, a full cask. I tried to buy one after 11 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> It was really, we released nine whiskies and four of them sold out within 15 minutes, uh, which was quite impressive for you know, full casts. Now, this is just, um, I don't know whether it was evaporation, whether it had you know, a load of stuff drawn back in the day, you know, if it was a, a, a split cast, but one which was split over the years. Um, I just, unfortunately, I just don't have any information about the actual cask of this whiskey. Um, but yeah, only a small number. And I say properly well done, you guys, for getting a hold of a bottle of this. Uh, I work for the Whiskey Exchange, and I didn't get a bottle of this. I literally have this much left in the bottom of a sample bottle. That's all I have to drink of it. So this was a lot fuller, but it was sat on my desk in the office. And I haven't been in the office recently because of all of this. Uh, but Sikinda, uh, the big boss, he's in every day. Every day. <laughs> drinking my whiskey. So I got the set, and I have not tried this yet or anything. When I... When I opened, uncorked it the first time and nosed, I was like, shit, I should have kept this. <laughs> but <laughs> this is nice. I think everyone will enjoy it. Uh, Billy, that, yeah, one thing is very obvious. So the other labels, I don't know if everybody saw all the labels. The other four look very different than this, right? So you kept mentioning this would be like the fifth bottling. Was that planned or was this kind of like you um, you guys said, wait, there, this should be a special occasion. Let's, let's throw a fifth in there as just like a special thing to reward people for coming back maybe or whatnot. Well, and then because the, the label is just so different, obviously. So it was a very special whiskey, very different than the other four. What was that thought process or what was that main reason for throwing a, a fifth in there and without the same label and all that was a last minute decision? Just, just trying to think what I can say now that I know that you're recording. So no, basically, <laughs> this was this is a surprise bonus whiskey. Um, the way that we do our, our, our selection, we said we're going to do four whiskeys. You know, uh, Raj, Mr. C, our designer said, I've got this concept for four labels. These are the four labels we're going to do. I'll talk about that in a bit. Um, but then the boss was tasting through some whiskeys, as he does fairly often. You know, he's got a very large holding of casks, and they, we draw samples, and he tries them to see what he wants to bottle for different ranges. And um, he hit this one and just went, let's do a fifth one. At which point in time, Raj suddenly went, what? I've done all the labels. You can't make me do any more. I've got a whole backlog of labels. So all of a sudden, this urgent label was jammed into his queue. And he'd been developing the um, the the branding for for the show, and he said, "You know, we, this extra one's not going to be part of the other series. This is going to be a celebration of the show. I'm going to use the show branding." He spent you know the last year putting this together and across all the different platforms, and so yeah, that's it came about because it was just literally one. The boss just went, "I want to do another one," and this is one of the perils of working for a uh, at the time, as it was entirely family owned company, is when one of the two members of the family who run the company sort of say. Yeah, I think we should do this now. That means we do that. So <laughs> we ended up sort of like a you know, last minute one. I didn't actually know what this whiskey was until it turned up um, because the, I didn't have the information through our little project management system and stuff like that. It was just literally an extra bottle. And as soon as it arrived, the company got very, very interested. And uh, our little allocation that we have put aside for staff, we do a ballot internally for, for staff who want to grab really limited edition bottles. Um, I didn't even bother putting my name in in the end because I realized quite how many people had already jumped on it. It was, uh, yeah, this one thing about the whiskey exchange, we, we might sell a load of whiskey, but we're also ridiculous whiskey geeks, a lot of us at the company. And so we end up trying to buy a lot of our own whiskey back again, which is, uh, well, good for the company. A, a large proportion of the, uh, the payroll goes straight back in. Hey, Billy, I got a quick question. And I think, I think you've done another Ben Nevis two years ago for the whiskey show. Yeah. Is it, how do you think this one stacks up to against that one? Give me a second to have a quick look of it. Uh, I, I have complete, because I look after a lot of our exclusives and talking about them, I have a complete list of everything we've ever bottled. But yeah. also, I have one of the worst memories uh, in the company. So uh, I don't actually keep information in my brain anymore because I forget it. So give me one second. I will have a look which one it was. Uh, yeah, I think, you needed a, especially... I think you needed some sort of light to look at the label. Oh, that one. Sorry, I actually I've got the uh, I've just about to see it. I have up there on the wall. Uh, that is the all the labels from those. I'll, I'll go and wave at that in a second. That one. 
this, this uh, it's not it's not that label. I mean, let's see if I can go. April Fools, see, right? see if I can. Oh, it's just too the, far away. That's the really annoying. Year, uh, no, it was not the April Fool. It was. Um, yeah, it was the, I, I it was the Bristol Show ones from two years ago. Um, 2019. And I know because I've been hunting it for a while and it just always just slips through my fingers. I will say about that one, um, it's better than this one. This one's good. Don't, don't get me wrong. I really like this one. But that one from two years ago is stunning. Um, I tried to get a bottle. And again, I, that one I did put my name in the ballot for and I didn't get it. Um, yeah. However, uh, Raj, I say Mr. C, he knows I quite like his work. Um, and so... After we bottle everything up, he did me some little mini labels. And so somewhere around here, I have um, a load of miniatures of all of them with, uh, oh, here we go. Here's the Ben Nevis. There we go. Yeah. Mini Ben Nevis label. Give me one second, actually. I'll just go and grab my little UV torch. What does everybody think? The Harold said there's a guava note that you always pick up in Ben Nevis. I always... Yeah, you'll probably understand. My flat is not very big. It's currently very, very full of whiskey. This room, so difficult to move around. But yeah, so it was these. This it was these ones, and it was. Oh, I meant funny. It's difficult to show it here, but if you shine UV light on it, it starts showing other things on the label. It's unfortunately a little oh, yeah. bit bright. Yeah. You can just about make it out. There we go. So yeah, it has all the other uh, cast details and everything done with UV. Got it. A bit like the April Fool's Day. But now this Ben Nevis, um, I, say I like it so much, I've got all the labels on my wall framed. Um, but this one was slightly better. It was a little bit younger, a little bit fresher. Uh, I'm really, really fruity. We bottle that at its peak. This is a slightly different style. It still has that fruit, but it still has a little, it has a little bit of that oaky spice to it, as you get with an extra three years of age. Um, still good. Unfortunately, yeah. this is one of our finest ones we've ever done. I do apologise for... For ruin, if, if you want, I can lie. This yeah. one's fantastic. This uh, is no, fine. Yeah, no this worries. one's awful. Awful. <laughs> Sorry to derail. Sorry to this derail. This one's got a little uh, bitterness or a little bit of tannin on the finish for me, yeah, oh, which is nice. I like it. But I also get a little, it's almost like there's a little hint of smoke at the end as well. So with all the whiskey show bottlings, the, the other four, I tried extensively. I wrote a load of notes for them and everything like that because we had a load of, we had enough of them to be able to actually have sample bottles around the office. Um, this is the only sample bottle we opened in the office. And so I've not got to try it anywhere near as much. So when you know James said, I've got all five of them, but I've got an excuse finally. Because you're not, um, you're not taking that back to the office, that stain. It's empty, can't you see? <laughs> That's right. That's right. Mm. Uh anybody else have any oh yeah, Mallory, milk guava, taste guava. Um, yeah, with Ben Nevis, it's kind of like you, it's one of those whiskeys that, you know, it's very, well, the 96s especially, they're very tropical, but you kind of know it when you, when you smell it, right? When you nose it, you're like, oh, this is the Ben Nevis that you can just tell. There's something about it that's a, it's a little bit oily, a little bit dirty, but it's, it's, like you said, it's a big fruit bomb that comes right off the nose real fast. And for this one, though, the, on the note, and this is, you know, like Mary was saying about the, the, the guava thing is actually a, a sort of point of it. On the palate, I get a lot more tropical fruit. On the nose, it's some fruit in there, but it's, it feels a little bit more sort of like stewed fruit. It's a bit more sort of stewed apples and stewed pears and that type of thing. Then you take a sip of it, and that's when you get a really big explosion of tropical fruit. The, the really classic tropical fruit flavors. For me, it, all, it doesn't tip, uh, there's some Irish whiskey which have this sort of character as well, but they, they tip all into sort of like gummy bears and sort of that type of fruit. Uh, this one actually stays in proper real fre uh, fresh tropical fruit rather than going into those sort of more sort of synthet synthetic flavors. I like all of them. Um, this is one of the things about working at the Whiskey Exchange is that um, if you work at the Whiskey Exchange, you generally seem to pick up a certain taste in whiskey. And it's very similar to Sikinda's taste in whiskey, you know, the big boss. It's almost like he feeds you the whiskeys that he likes and tells you that they're good. And eventually mm -hmm. Stockholm Syndrome sort of sets in and all of a sudden you start agreeing with your captor. And uh, yeah, you go downhill from there, really. So my, my taste of whiskey is very, very similar to Sikinda's these days. Um, which is a problem because he's got a very expensive taste in whiskey. So yes. I, I spend my time seeking out ridiculous fruit bombs and these sort of like you know, things that try and remind me of old Moors from the 1960s. And uh, I've been very, very fortunate to try some great whiskey, but at the same time, it definitely has ruined my wallet over the years. I think that is very old, old, old and rare is definitely a wallet damager. Oh, yeah. I think that's true because a lot of the. Um, 
independent bottlings and the independent casts that you guys bottle, uh, they're usually, they're always very high quality too, but they're very carefully selected. It's, it's like, at least, at least I, I think so, like compared to a lot of the other independent bottlers, it's almost like everybody got to a warehouse, but you guys are first in line every time. So you, like, like your Ben Nevis versus like the next Ben Nevis or your Laphroaig independent, all your, actually all your Laphroaig sherries that you've ever bottled versus everyone else's. Is there, is there, is there something behind that? Or is that just coincidental that there's just like a taste profile that keeps coming up? There's two different myths here. One is that we did get there first. Sekinda is an alarmingly prescient chap. And we have owned a lot of these casks for a long time. So this is not us recently buying some Ben Nevis. This is some Ben Nevis that we put down a while ago. And so Sekinda said, eh, I think it should turn out something good. Or oh, I, I can see something in this. Um, and that's the same with Ben Nevis with all the Freugs. Um, you know, we, the Freugs we've had since, before, well, the ones that are now hitting in their 20s. We've had those since before I started 10 years ago. Um, I remember us re-racking them back in 2011, 2012, when I started being involved in some of that. I remember us discussing how we're going to re-rack them. We've looked after these whiskeys for a long time. And so Skinner's got good stocks. He's had them for a long time. That combination just means that, yeah, we, we did get to the warehouse first. It was just, you know, a decade before everybody else. But this, the style thing is a big thing. And these next four whiskeys aren't really our usual styles. It's our usual style is very much more this. This is, it's not all about the cask. It's all about the spirit. It's all about the distillery it's come from. And that fruitiness, that obsession with where it's from and the underlying spirit character, that is Sekinda's thing. Uh, it's now become my thing. Um, and loads of the other folks at the company is our style of whiskey. Um, but the next one we're going to try, they're all sort of focused on sherry casks, but it's all of them will still have and still do have an idea of the distillery underneath. And that, that's the character that we always try to go for. Every now and again, we'll, we'll do something which is just a stupid cask. And it's all about the cask. It'll be a great cask, but it will all be about the cask flavor rather than the distillery. But that's very much the exception rather than the rule. But every now and again, you know, we've got Highland Park on the website at the moment. That is the same color as Coke, and it tastes like Coke. It, it, it is the most colory whiskey you'll ever have tried. It's ridiculous. But Skinner kind of tried it, it just went, tastes like Coke. Or bottle that yeah and it, again it's that sort of thing where we know people are going to love it we have our own style that we love but having that commercial head on as well it's like people will like yeah they like the stuff we like but every now and again you go yeah let's do a sh city sherry cask you know <laughs> that's why it's so awesome that you said there's the, the, the spirit characters underneath these because yeah there's so many sherry whiskeys i think we all try that are just so sherry you don't even know where it's from it's just really hard to tell yeah that moment that you lose the distillery for me is often a problem if the cask is really good and the spirit can hold up to it then that's still fine that's great as long as it tastes nice in the end but it always feels like a little bit of a oh i want to taste glen farkless not just a cask you know we're going to a sorry secret space side distillery shortly um but if you ever tried a um um or well, they don't call them bourbon cask glen farkless but um like refill Glen Farkless, like many times refill or, or bourbon cask Glen Farkless. It's nothing like the Glen Farkless you you've tried, which are from Sherry Cask, and they're beautiful. Um, but it's, it's that, that's, it's those sorts of situations where you suddenly go, oh, it feels like a little bit of a waste that we've taken this distillery, driven out all of what makes it special. But at the same time, if you have a really nice whiskey still, yeah, I can forgive it. So. Yeah, I, I always laugh when I find the bourbon barrel, the Farkless, Bourbon barrel from Drona. I mean, they're totally different than what we used to. Well, I think this is phenomenal. I love Ben Nevis. I've got, a, you know, I've got a whole stock of other Ben Nevis from like random places. If anyone's tried the new Ben Nevis, the new, uh, is, I don't even know if it's a 10, the two, the, there's two or three new releases. It's a new they're NAS very, one that's just come out. I'm, I've got a little sample of it around somewhere. Yeah. They're very different, uh, which is yeah. interesting, but it shows their evolution too about where they're going. Uh, but I guess, Anybody else, any other parting notes on Ben Nevis? Uh, I know Mallory, you, you mentioned guava, anything else that you wanted to add? Uh, I just think this is phenomenal. Yes, it's a fruit bomb, really special, um, but also just special to enjoy with you all and as part of the whiskey show collection. So phenomenal start. Yeah, it, it was the one which when it was finally announced to me, oh, by the way, the other one is a Ben Nevis. There was definitely a bit of a, oh no, what an awful thing. It will be delivered to my desk, won't it? Thank you, good, yeah, there we go. 
Uh, it's um, as I say, it's, it's a great thing to be able to celebrate this. You know, whiskey show was you know a couple of months back now. I'm just starting to get over the sort of like you know the tiredness from it and all that sort of business. It's been it's Christmas time for us, you know, in retail, and we have show then Christmas, and it's, it's great to have this time just have a look back on it and go, oh yeah, that was a really good weekend. Oh, the whiskey was good too. So uh, yeah, thanks for the opportunity to uh, to jump on that. Yeah. So anyway, should, should we should we move on to the next whiskey? Yeah. Sounds good. Right, so oh, so it's quite dark in here. I keep on missing the whiskies on the floor. We're going to move on, and also I'll just quickly bring them all up so you can see the labels. Um, we're going to start off with the next one, which is a Bunahaven 19 year old. So, this is a 2001 vintage, distilled on the 5th of October and bottled on the 30th of August this year. So um, as I said, we always try and um, have a theme to our series, and unfortunately, I don't have enough hands to hang, pick them up at the same time. But as you can see, this year we've gone comic book characters. It's it's not quite. It, again, I don't know how how geeky you guys are on comics, um, but as you can tell from my my picture of the best Batman ever in the background, Adam West watches over me while I do tastings just to make sure everything's good. Um, I'm a comic book collector. I've I've been buying and reading comics for significantly too long um but yeah so these are trying to get some of the feel of the silver age of comic books we have you know the layout is very much like the old comic book labels rather than the comics code authority we have uh, alexi distillers our former sister company who bottled them for us um and raj came to me after he had came up with the idea and just sort of said well you're the comic book geek if i come up with a load of superheroes could you tell me if they look all right and my answer was yes, yes, they do. So um, the names of all of these, they, they, along with the whiskey distillery name, they've also got, uh, each of them has got a name based on the compounds that give whiskeys flavor. And I'm very proud to say this is my fault as well. Um, I am a trainer. Part of my job is I train people in the way that booze is made and how to taste booze and what it tastes like across the whole spectrum of different types of uh, spirit. Um, and I do that uh, using courses by the Wine and Spirits Educational, T Educational Trust, WSET. Uh, and so I've been doing a lot of WSET level two spirits during lockdown, all over Zoom. And uh, Mr. C came along to one of my classes. I, I asked him, did, did he want to do some training? And eventually he was convinced that maybe he should do some training. You know, he's been working, designing stuff around the, the drinks world for 20 years. Maybe he should learn a bit more about how they're made. And he came out at the end of it absolutely enthused by the learning about spirits he's like i didn't know this stuff there's so much stuff i learned but especially he learned about the a little bit about the chemistry side and so all these superheroes are superheroes whose names are things which give whiskey its flavor so we have esther electron to start off with for the bunahaven captain congener aurora aldehyde and the phenolic phantom all picking out flavor compounds and sort of uh, classes of flavor compound which Raj just suddenly discovered and suddenly learned and also just reckoned these are the superheroes of whiskey. These are the things that give them flavor. So it all came together as a slightly dodgy conceit, but it's a good reason for us to have absolutely excellent labels and also some fairly cool names. Um, but also it was quite nice for, for Raj to sort of like tell everybody, oh, it's Billy's fault. I always like when people tell, you know, nice whiskey's my fault. Well, I like so, the note from this one. How important yeah so killer nose on this awesome but a a bit of a uh bit of a weird piece it, it changes it has changed it will continue to change over the years and um, you know they're doing loads of refurb at the moment uh back in the 90s uh they started trying to peak things and failed they then started again in the early 2000s and did a lot better um they're always tweaking and they're also a much bigger distillery than people think. You know, they potentially they're one of the biggest distilleries on Isla. Um, potentially because they don't actually distill as much as they could. But that variation in character, that change in character over the years, does mean that there are eras of Bunahaven, but also lots of different styles of Bunahaven. So you can find this, you know, young, feisty, smoky ones. You can find absolutely ancient things, which are you know, hints of peat in the background. Or something like this, which is all about bringing together rich sort of like maritime spirit with really good sherry cask. 
So first of all, this one's still in stock, right? If everyone everyone loves it, they can actually still buy this. Yeah, so this uh, this one came out of um, a butt, so it's a little bit more of it knocking around. So um, I've actually got the number on there. Give me a second, I shall look up the number. Um, but yeah, so this one is still available. Um, we have this, and as far as I know, if it hasn't disappeared since, uh, the Secret Space Side, which I can't possibly tell you that it's from Glen Farkas, um, is the, the other one we have at the moment. Well, that might have sold out since. I haven't checked. Uh, it looks week. like it's there. The blend looks like it's there, too. Oh, the blend as well. Okay, cool. Let's come back. We, we, uh, we had things disappear, then we found a few more uh, cases hiding in the warehouse. Um, it took us a long time to check all the stock back in from the show. So everything we sold down at the show, all the leftover stuff came back in. So things still, even now, almost two months later, things keep on popping up as someone finds another box on the pallet. I, so, I don't talk about this, Billy, but I don't know if anybody knows. Did you mention about the 3D glasses, part of the labels, that whole not element? Not yet. Okay. That's, that's my next thing I'm going to get onto. So first thing okay. first is looking at is the superheroes. Harold had a quick um, question. Actually. Well, you can, you can hold off on that then. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Um, I need to, I need to have some mysterious stick to come up with the next one. So, uh, yeah, I was going to say, uh, I noticed right away with the, the, uh, distillation, the year it was the old one and the math kind of set it off. I remember you guys put out a great cask, uh, last year, I guess it was the 1253 of the Gunahaven, uh, very well received, great taste notes. I, I had a bottle of myself. It was delicious. Uh, and this set off reminders of that right away. So I want to know if, uh, if you knew this was maybe a sister cask, that one of the 1253. Um, again, same distillation date too. I say it was yeah, it was, it was whiskey show bottling one, wasn't it? Um, no, it was a uh, single malt in Scotland. Just, oh, uh, single, sorry. I don't, yeah. I, I don't deal with single malt in Scotland. Um, oh. you say it's one of mine. It's not. Uh, this is the thing which I've, is now really, really different. Elixir Distillers, um, the people who bottle this for us and bottle the single malt in Scotland, um, they've been a very separate company for the last two or three years. Um, back in the day, I used to work on all the single malt of Scotland bottlings. I used to work on Port of Skeg, uh, and actually come up with the vattings uh, of that. But when um, they became popular enough that we, it wasn't only the Whiskey Exchange selling it, they really broke off as a separate company. So I don't really touch the single malt of Scotland stuff. And so it even got to the point now where they don't even pass the tasting notes by me for proofreading. It used to be great. They, they send me tasting notes. I could, so I could go, right, I need to get one of those. Now I have to go and beg uh, samples often if I want to try them myself. So... Um, Inevitably, if it's the same distillation year, it will be a sister cask almost certainly because generally we don't buy one or two casks these days. When we first started out, Sikenda would buy you know, like two or three casks at a time. Now we buy a lot. Um, at least you just still, I think I'm saying we, we only got acquired a month ago. I'm still trying to get used to the whole separation of the different companies. But um, Elixir Distillers, when they buy casks and when Sikenda buy casks, he buys you know tens up to hundreds these days at a time. And so this will be a batch of Bernard Harbins we bought a little while back, which we've been tinkering with and keeping an eye on. Um, yeah, we've done a few, I think, from 2001. And I think they're all probably sister casks. Looks like the same distillation date too. So I, I was assuming that. I was just wanted to confirm. Yeah, but uh, unfortunately, yeah. So seeing what's got and stuff, I, I can't really talk about so much these days. So I just don't get a chance to try them. Um, they're putting out loads of great whiskeys as well. Um, my, my mate, Ollie, uh, Ollie Chilton, who's their... Um, uh, I'm not entirely certain what he's calling himself these days. Um, he's business development director and he's blender. Um, at one point in time, I referred to him as a head of despair. It was one of his many job titles that he's had. But uh, but he's the guy behind the selection of a lot of those whiskeys. And he works with Sikinda at the moment anyway to choose things for the whiskey exchange. Uh, we'll see how that changes as we sort of go on. But uh, yeah, he is behind the selection of uh, these four bottles, uh, these five bottles even, along with Sikinda. He's the guy who had the horrible job of going through all the hundreds of samples to whittle it down to only a few tens of samples for Skinder to try, including this great Ben Harlan. So this is, yeah, definitely sherry casks being involved at this point in time. As far as I know, it's a single butt. But it's still got some Ben Harlan hiding there in the background. And this is perfect in time, too. Holidays are coming and it's getting a little cooler. That's like a peat season. It's like this sort of sherry style season as well for a lot of us here. I'm sure all over the world too. At the same time, whether it, it's not totally dried fruit, dark and stickiness, there's still a little bit of brightness in here as well. For me, there's a load of um, 
sort of uh, baked apple and stewed apple and poached pear and those sort of like you know brighter orchard fruit sort of character in there as well as having that richer darker sort of side to it um that nose has a ton of just spiced apple on it and yeah. cinnamon sticks mm. yeah de definitely the right time of year for it but yeah it, it's i like the fact that it still maintains some of that sort of like that freshness because you know as we go through the next couple of them, it gets darker and darker. This is very much, you know, the, the, the brighter of the three. And James, I may have that ball your friend was talking about. It's, uh, oh. I get a tiny bit more sulfur on this one, but it's also a really, really good bottling. He just went to the bathroom, so we missed it, but I'll tell him. <laughs> it's cast 12, 1253. Oh. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I got a question actually for everybody here because it's a really stupid question, but it's actually a very complex question. And it's, it's something that you said, Billy, about Buna Abin and the character. So Olaf and I and, and a few others here go, we used to go to the Scotch Malt Whiskey Tasty monthly tastings here in New York City. Everyone knows that club. I think everybody knows it. Um, they would do a monthly tasting. You sit down, they do like six drams, whatever. And every month after a while, you learn a heck of a lot about whiskey. But they would do it blind. So you wouldn't know what was what until the end of the tasting. Buna Avin was always the one that nobody could ever guess. It was the hardest thing to guess. And the society has like 12 different profiles, 12 different colors from peat and all the way down to like light and delicate. And we've literally seen them in like almost every, uh, probably every single one of those over time. And I'm sure there's other distilleries that are very um, versatile in various different formats, sherry, different types of cast styles, different aging, whatnot. But my question is, everybody, what is the spirit character of Punavan? Like, can you actually name that? If, you, if it's a 12 off the shelf, then sure. But I don't know that that's actually representative of all the stuff that, that's going out there. I have a really, so it's a stupid question because I have no idea, but it's a complex question because after a while you're like, I actually don't know that I know what it is. Is it peated? Is it non-peated? Is it fruity? Is it floor? Like, what is that spirit character that someone says, oh, that's like a Punavan? I think it's the hardest one to pick out of everything I've ever tried. Yeah, they're super diverse, but for their standard range of bottlings and most of their bottlings is to me, there's always like a thread of salted cream. It's this backbone of creaminess and richness that I get in a Buna. And sometimes I can pick it up, but when you go into these independent bottlings, it just gets harder and harder. To me, what was funny is when I was on Isla, we got to try the new make. And the new make is like the most robust of all the Isla whiskeys, which you really wouldn't expect. But at the same time, that really robust new make, that's the stuff which is going to be turning into whiskey soon. They change over the time. You know, I, I was speaking to the former now distillery manager, um, well, the site manager for all of the different, uh, you know, for Stephen Woodcock, who's now over at Glen Murray. Um, we had a peated 1996 Bernhaven, and they weren't doing peated whiskey back in 96. And so I, I poked him and said, I've got a peated Bernhaven from 96. What's going on? And he said, oh, yeah, that's our experiments. We, we wanted to try and do some peated Bernhaven. We had a go with it and um, it didn't hit the spec that we wanted. So as it didn't hit the spec we wanted, we, we sold it off to um, brokers and then it's gone into the market and people have bought it. And we tried again about 10 years later and it worked that time. And now you have um, Stoysha, yeah. Moina, all these different, um, Margadale, all these different makes. As far as I know, all these different names you hear, these are different names for different projects and different slightly different specs, which they've done for other people. They've done contract distilling over the years, which has sort of like bled into some of their normal production. They they just change. They are they're one of those distilleries which has evolved so much over time. And so yeah, James, I I I, I can't pick it out ever anyway. You know, we, we I've already sort of like you know hand waved enough over this whiskey in its style. This is you know fairly classic sort of big sherry burner from this era. But that's all you can really say. It's just you know. One of the reasons I quite like Bernard Harmon is because as you go back and play around in time, you just get such different styles. You know, if you get a chance and if you see it, I thoroughly recommend look at the stuff that's like 40, 50 years ago. There's a few casts of that pop up from time to time. I know Elixir Distillers did one for the Single Malt of Scotland range. Um, or actually, you know, they, they did a Port of Skeg 45, which was 45 year old Bernard Harmon. And it's stunning absolutely stunning like a pair of sherry butts they found out the back of the warehouse they bottle some for themselves as well as their 40 year old you know it's that sort of stuff absolutely incredible but no resemblance to this it's just such a ridiculous distillery you know such a wide variation usually with every whiskey tasting there's always a boon in there 
someone brings it. It's always there. There's always one bottle there, at least one that someone brought. He did not eat it either, yeah. Yeah. And the last other thing is that Ben Harbin um, have produced a lot of whiskey for other people. Uh, Distel, who own them now, um, formerly, oh, I can't remember what they were calling themselves beforehand. It's, it's gone around the houses a little bit, who's owned it. But it's always been um, a core of uh, blended whiskey. And so uh, both uh, Distel and, almost had the name, uh, Black Bottle, uh, the blended whiskey, as well as um, Highland Distiller stuff. So stuff the Edrington group do so famous grouse and things like that it'll have some Bernhaven in you know Bernhaven is just used all over the place it's an absolutely solid core of, uh, of blended whiskey and, and so they use everything too sorry have you been to the warehouse they have like every brand in their warehouse oh yeah yeah yeah. they will do that's part of the, the choice of well a bit of insurance there make sure if anybody's warehouse goes up you don't lose everything <laughs> you know, but it really is um, you know Everybody has been Harvin. They make so much of it and so little of it in comparison goes out to them. And that's you know, one of the great things about Ben Harvin when it comes to indies is you can always find some Ben Harvin if you want to bottle some. It's got a great name. It tastes good. And there's so many different variations of it that as an independent bottler, it's actually a great thing to be able to get hold of because you know people are going to buy it because they know it's going to be great. And you can also make your own name with it. You can choose your style of Ben Harvin. So I... I so I, I quite like the stuff. I did a middle of lockdown. I ended up doing a Bunnahaven tasting. Uh, they booked in to do a Bunnahaven virtual tasting with the Whiskey Exchange, which is meant to be me talking to uh, one of their brand ambassadors. Uh, then all their brand ambassadors were busy. So I had to do a presentation all about Bunnahaven to a bunch of folks who bought tasting kits and were expecting somebody who worked for the company. Uh, <laughs> so I did a load of research into it and all of a sudden realized I quite like Bunnahaven. So... <laughs> um, I must say, apart from Matt, has anybody visited? Peter Shake said, I have. Well, I is. went there before the new um, just visitor room. The old one, I always remember, if you have to use the restroom, you got to go up the stairs and you're literally walking by, peeking yeah, your head in people's it. offices as you go to the bathroom. <laughs> and the bathroom's got like a thin wall between that and the next office. You can hear everything. Or you go to the one in the warehouse. Oh, yeah. Yeah. secret insider knowledge find, find the best bathroom it's the sort of distillery where knowing the best bathroom is the sort of thing you learn, learn when doing a tour it's it's at the end of the road so you go to Kalila and you keep on driving and you keep on driving down a thinner and thinner road and you end up down by, down by the sea and you've got a pier there and these days it's looking quite nice they put a lot of work into it recently <coughs> excuse me uh, Brendan McCarran who's now the uh, sort of like oh, site manager yeah. across them formerly at Ardbeg um I was speaking to him the other day and I sort of said to him, you know, how's it going? How, how's, how's the new job going? He said, well, it's really weird. Um, I've discovered a lot more about the logistics of paint. I was like, well, what do, what do you mean? He said, well, getting paint to Isla is difficult. Getting paint to the end of the road on Isla is even more difficult. And then you get budgets which say that buying the paint isn't enough. You have to use the paint. Otherwise, it doesn't count in this year's budget. So we're basically getting folks just to lever open tins of paint and dip brushes in it and just paint a bit of wall with every single tin of paint to try and make sure they come in, in underneath the right year's budget. Because they're really just totally redoing the distillery at the moment and painting it up, making it look beautiful again. Because it's been so neglected over the years. It just sat there, you know, it was always quite famous that you, you end up there. It was always a grey day when you were visiting Bunnahaven, no matter how nice it was anywhere else. By the time you got to the end of the road, it was all grey and... There were many com you know, comments about how it looked a bit like a concentration camp, you know, a photograph from sort of like, a, you know, big sort of like wheel. high stone walls and, you know, looked like you weren't gonna, ever going to leave after getting in there. But these days, they're really putting in effort to try and make it a great place to visit as well as a place that makes great whiskey. I love the dock. Sitting by the word Bonahaba by the beach, it's great. Well, the pier is great. If you, if you yeah. get down there, you get out on the pier, it pokes out into the uh, uh, Sound of Isla, you, know, you can see Jura just, you know, almost sort of touchable. It's so close sort of thing. And I've been down there on a really, really horrible day. Um, I went to Jura shortly afterwards, and it was the worst ferry ride ever. Because they, between um, Isla and Jura, there's a, a, a sound, and the current's really, really strong. So the boat just needs to go like this between the two, between Port, Port Askeg and the ferry uh, on Jura. But the boat aims in this direction and then just basically just fights against the current 
and go side, you know, just about manages. So it has to go straight into the current and then just slowly moves across. It's one of the weirdest boats I've ever been on. Um, only take should only take like literally five minutes if that and it normally takes a lot longer because it's it's going so much of a greater distance because it's actually having to fight against the current all the way um, there are lots of deer on jura uh, a lot of deer try to swim to isla there aren't very many deer on isla not many of them yeah. make it they, they will end up in the atlantic so yeah it's a, a weird place but a and properly remote on isla which is fairly remote anyway but making great whiskey like this so Thanks. Yeah. Any, any any more thought? Any more questions? Any well, big ones? Any more thoughts on the whiskey? What do you reckon? I really like this one. Uh, it was. I think actually, I, I, I was fortunate enough to try them all before. And this is one of my favourites. Sure. Yeah. If, if you like this sort of style of Buna, which really does balance, you know, that big sherry cast thing with that sort of fruity spirit character coming through. Um, and it's Esther Electron is the name, and annoyingly they didn't speak to me about what the flavor compounds actually mean and the sorts of flavors that would actually be in there. Out of choice, I would have matched this up with the Ben Nevis because that fruitiness from the Ben Nevis is all esters. Ester compounds give that sort of fruitiness. But that apple, pear sort of like fresh fruitiness that shines through on the bunner here, that's all esters as well. So it does have a nice chunk of ester sort of character in there which pokes its way past all those sherry casks which is great i, I thought adding a couple drops of water really helps and made it a little creamier um so it had that big sherry kind of balance but i thought there was a, a, a much more pronounced creaminess with just a tiny tiny you know two drops of water oh no i seem to have an excuse to pour myself some more <laughs> thank you very much Thanks again. See, I'm a professional uh, pipette here. It, it looks like a teeny tiny turkey baster, but you know, it seems to work. Nice. I use an eyedropper. <laughs> oh, my, my, my problem with adding water to sherry cask whiskies is that so often it doesn't work. You know, sherry yeah, cask is so up. prone to falling to pieces and becoming sort of like indistinct. And, but for Bernard Harvin, I have in the past just sat there and highballed them up. You know, big sherry cask Bernard Harvin, no matter how old, they often can take a nice big slug. <laughs> Uh, of water which is always good i see what you mean though that's prop texture wise as well yeah a few drops of water almost like you make it sort of like thicker on the palate as well and so yeah. much more fruit in there and creaminess oh excellent i shall keep that one for later <laughs> oh yeah yeah it's one of those weird ones you get especially and this is why i'm increasingly becoming I write a lot more about and talk about is the texture of a whiskey and you know, adding water doesn't Ooh. necessarily make a whiskey thinner. It's, it's weird. Mm -hmm. you know? um, and it's something we don't necessarily talk about so much or even consciously think about, but it's something that's really part of the whole experience of drinking a whiskey and just leads to everything about it. Really, you know, it, it's a really, really important part of, you know, the flavor. We talk about um, flavor and, you know, taste and all this sort of thing it's a combination of all of your senses you know it's smell it's touch uh it's taste um and the touch bit is the fact that your tongue can feel things and inside of your mouth can feel you have all those nerves in there and so you actually pick up that texture and the brain combines that with smell and with taste brings it all together and makes it come from the tongue the flavor as you perceive it you, when you taste something you say oh it's all coming from my tongue that's actually the whole of your mouth it's the inside of your nose it's all these things come together sort of like brought together by the brain and, and localized to one point um, i've got a book at the moment all about smell and taste um by harold mcgee who is uh if anybody's read anything about food science harold mcgee's like you know the godfather of, uh, of food science uh on food and cooking is pretty much the textbook you need to read if you're looking for the science of food and cooking at all he just done one called goodness is it goodness knows heaven knows. it's something knows anyway um a goodness knows is richard patterson's book that's not a science book um nose dive there we go that is a book it's on my list and i'm working my way to it um all right have you have you read it yet i've read select this selected parts only i've just started to browse for it I, i've heard nothing but goodness it's um but that's the bit it's i need to get onto next I'm reading, I'm not in the other room. I'm reading a book at the moment called Delicious. 
um, which is a book about the science of flavor, but it starts from a very sim single thing, which is uh, why do things taste nice? I read that, my mind has been blown repeatedly every time I read another page of it, it's great. But, um, but yeah, so the, the adding water and that change of texture and the way that changes the flavor and your perception of it is something which I'm really, really interested in looking into at the moment. As you might be able to tell um, from that. So <laughs> oh, no. Anybody else, any, any thoughts on the burner? Anybody, I love anybody that not like it? So I love that it's balanced. I think both of these have killer noses so far. Um, the, when I first got into whiskey, I went to a tasting and saw an older couple show up. And I swear to they, they didn't drink anything. They might have like barely sipped, but they just nosed. And I never really understood it until a long time after. But I get it. When you, I, I'm sure that folks that even came by the booth at the whiskey show were just like nose, walking around nosing, just like, wow. These, at least these two so far, I'm sure the rest is fantastic. And then the, on the palate, it's very well balanced. It's not too, like that share, you know, that sherry that is like we see too much of. It's like a either seasoned sherry or it's a PX that just overtakes the spirit. This at 19 years, I think, is perfectly balanced. I think it's really, really great. Yeah, that's the thing I'm quite pleased with it. You know, we, we generally catch things before the sherry cask overtakes because that's not our style. And this is very much that thing of the sherry cask is there, but it hasn't killed everything else. And that's really important. We're talking about the whole sort of nose thing. I'm just looking at my taste. I got, I have books and you know, books and books down here of of tasting notes, and almost always, my notes on the nose are longer than the notes on the palate. You know, when you know something and then you taste it, the palate is a combination of what you get on the nose and what you get on the tongue, and that combination. But by the time I, you know, talking about what I get in the mouth, I already talked a little about a lot of that when I talk about the nose. You know, it's uh, yeah. So my notes are always you know very much all sort of focused on sort of complexity in the nose. And then nowhere near as much normally. Well, this one unfortunately ruins the entire point. But hey, um, yeah, often I'm finding out I can't write as much about the palette because you know the nose is where so much of it comes from. And you do hear tales, especially of blenders, not drinking, you know, almost being teetotal sort of thing, and just focusing entirely on the smell because that's the really important bit for them. That's the bit where they get the information they need to be able to do their jobs which is quite useful if you're somebody who is a master blender who has to sort of like, you know, examine 200 samples every single morning. You get pretty good at using your nose rather than your tongue because otherwise you're drunk by lunchtime, no matter what you're doing with it. So, oh boy. Anyway, shall we move on to our next whiskey? Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Cool. So next on the list, we have, oh no, that's the blend. Here we go. We have a, a mysterious whiskey from an anonymous space-side distillery, Glen Farkless. Um, Captain Congener. It is a 20-year-old. It was distilled on the 5th of June, 2001, and bottled on the 30th of August, 2021. Now, as I said, this, this is a Glen Farkless. Um, the, the standard sort of like rule that uh, Glen Farkless have is that you can't use their name. Uh, there have been many... Uh, discussions of this over the years and Glen Farquhar sell a lot of whiskey um, into the brokerage market and into the um, independent bottling market but you unless you're cabin heads which as far as I know there was a court case uh, between uh, yeah Headley, Headley Wright and um, John Grant Headley Wright from uh, from cabin heads and Springbank uh, and uh, John Grant from Glen Farquhar are pretty much the unstoppable force and immovable object of a uh, sort of like philosophical discussion um you don't mess with either of them and so uh yeah they eventually went, ended up going to court and i think yeah as matt was waving his hand around uh spring so can now do two glen farkless a year under the name glen farkless and they're the only people who are allowed to use the name everybody else doesn't it was funny because uh one year they had one you know, unknown space side but if you looked at the uh price area on the bottom it said glen farkless and they didn't realize that when they released it. So that's like a good collector's item. That was number three that year. And we're, we're very careful. Never, we like the guys at Glenn Farkas. You know, we've worked with them since we started. We do a lot of independent. Well, we do. They do some exclusive bottlings for us at the Whiskey Exchange. So we don't want to, you know, don't want to annoy them. You know, they're friends of ours. Um, George Grant, the sort of like, you know, the current sort of sales manager and sort of second in command of the distillery from the Grant family who own it, um, is really good friend of Sekinder's and, you know, 
we're not going to not going to mess things up or go against what they want. Uh, but it doesn't stop us telling everybody all the time that if it says space side distillery, you know, we just yeah, I, I didn't tell you it was going for us. Obviously, yeah, it's a family owned space side distiller famous for using sherry casks. Who could it be? And so, um, yeah, they're, they're, they're fine with us telling people sort of thing, but not sticking it on a bottle. So this is a 20 year old cast strength in Farkas. Um, this is Captain Congener. Uh, congeners are the sort of overall um, sort of chemical compound sort of name for things which have flavor. When we talk about in the WSCT world, we talk about when you are distilling what you are doing, it's very much, it's all about um, selectively concentrating alcohol and congeners. So it's the alcohol in, the, in, your, in your wash that you're trying to sort of like concentrate to make sure it's nice and boozy in the spirit, but you also select the flavors that you want around the same boiling point as that, the congeners. Um, yeah, so Raj went with Captain Congener, and this is the point where the, the lovely 3D glasses that Matt's wearing uh, he's not only doing that to be stylish, although, as we know, uh, Doc Lurin is one of the more stylish people we know. Uh, it's also because um, the labels have got, if you look really carefully at them, you can see there's a little bit of a sort of like, you know, fuzziness and sort of a little bit of uh, red, blue sort of 3D glasses, sort of like um, jiggling with the imagery. And so that if you do put on your 3D glasses, in my case, over the top of my glasses, because I can't see anything without them, I can barely see anything anyway. You can just about see some 3D effects all over the label, different layers. Taking, sorry, I feel slightly sick right away these. Uh, so on the labels, you know, adding that sort of like a element of depth in there as well as the characters and everything on there as well. Um, I don't know if you guys, have you guys heard of uh, Neil and Joel, um, Neil Ridley and Joel Harrison? There are a couple of whiskey writers over here in the UK. They're on TV every now and again doing cocktail stuff. Um, but they've uh, released a load of whiskies back in the day, including one called 3D, uh, which had a 3D label and had a 3D printed case that you could, uh, they would send you the spec for, you can have printed. It's about six years ago, and at the time, I think it was a 24 hour print, uh, and would cost you several hundred pounds if you had it done. And as far as I know, nobody ever did. Uh, but they, uh, after we released these with the, yeah, the 3D stuff on them, uh, I, I received a message saying, oh, stealing our ideas, are you? Um, I had a chat with them the other day and uh, they and Raj um, at dinner had a bit of a chat and they sort of like, Raj said, no, no, I didn't copy. It was a homage. It was a homage to your labels. So they're, they're all friends again now. Um, but yeah, we, done, we did the 3D stuff a few years ago with lenticular labels. Um, so that when you sort of like tilted them, you can sort of see 3D effects in them. Um, we've done it as we did the um, UV stuff. So hidden things in the labels. Um, we sort of, tweaked every year, done something, tried to do something a little bit interesting. Um, the most ridiculous one so far has been the lenticular labels because they were quite thick plastic. Um, and unfortunately, they kept on popping off the bottles. So you get some glue, regular glue, and you stick them on, and they just go, boing, disappear. Uh, we ended up, I think it was 12 different glues we tried. And the 12th glue worked really well. Uh, and it's quite fortunate because the stuff they used to stick Kevlar jackets together for the military. So um, that, that stuck a label to a bottle. So if you've got some of those, uh, those lenticular label, 3D label bottles, um, you might be able to chip the, uh, the, the label off, but you might be quite lucky because that is stuff that is trying to hold bulletproof vests together. So uh, yeah, it's, these always take a little bit longer than you think. You know, the, the 3D, uh, not 3D, the, the UV labels. Um, does anybody know of anything else which might have UV light related sort of like things, you know, things that might be in your wallets at the moment? It takes a lot of um, red tape to be allowed to use that ink, let's just say. So, uh, yeah, the printer we work with, lovely guy called Baz, who we've known for years, Raj and him, you know, I think we might have even gone to school together. But Baz is our guy when it comes to doing interesting printing. Um, and he is now licensed to use basically anti-theft counterfeit inks. Um, so all that UV stuff, he actually had to get certified to be able to use it and our labels are the first things he used for them. So, yeah, it's um, for very good really things like whiskey. <laughs> well, I'm trying to work. We've been trying to work out interesting ways of doing anti counterfeiting stuff on whiskey labels, and unfortunately, it's uh, it's seemingly quite easy to do the UV stuff compared to some things. But yeah, it's um, but yeah, you literally to actually buy the ink and the paper stock, you had to actually go through a security check to be able to do so, which we found quite funny. 
There we go. Back onto the whiskey. So this is um, a 20-year-old Glen Farkless, as I said. Um, this is, I don't know how long we actually have these casks. We, we have some knocking around in, in the stash. Not as many as, uh, as many because um, Glen Farkless generally gets snapped up by blenders. And because you can't put the name on the bottle, it doesn't generally end up that much in the, uh, the world of independence. But we like it. We like the guys at the distillery. So we always try to make sure we have some knocking around ready for release. And this is stepping down a little bit further down that sherry cask sort of like path. It's still not all as big a sherry as you might expect from a Glen Farkless. If you've had sort of like the Glen Farkless 21, which almost turns into a liqueur with like the thickness and sweetness. This is still has some freshness in here. But it also has a nice chunk of oak and a load of sherry. Again, rich dried fruit, fruit cake, sort of marzipan-y sort of like tinges. But still has for me some, rather than just being all raisins, there's some sultanery notes in there as well. Some baked apple, sort of like, you know, apple sauce type stuff in there as well. So it's on its way to being a lot more about the cask, but it still has a little bit of that Glen Farkless sort of sweet fruitiness in there still. So what do we think? I get a bit of a kind of there's a background note of tea, something like that, that uh, is a little bit different than a typical sherry cask, I think. Bit bit herbal, bit floral, that mm. sort of thing. Yeah. And again, some of Glen Farkless's spirit, there, there's definitely you get sort of a grassy, fruity note when it's really young. Um, and so, yeah, it's still hiding in there a little bit. It's amazing that the nose doesn't have as much alcohol as the palate. You can definitely taste the ABV. Yeah, it's definitely a little bit hot towards the end on it. But yeah, you, you can't just sit here snorting it for, for as long as you want, really. It's, uh... I say it, the palate is really big, thick, fruit cakey sort of thing. But on the, for me, I definitely get some green grass, that sort of herbal sort of tea like note that Richard was mentioning, some more fresh fruit. But definitely it has all those big sherry cast things going on in there. Sorry. Yeah, this is bottled at 57.6. So it's got a little bit of a punch to it. Got a little bit of a spice note at the end too. Definitely, yeah. It, it's um, it, it's been twenty years in wood, so I, I'd hope there to be a, a little bit in there, sort of thing. But I think it's just about controlled. Mm. Bit a bit of water brings out actually some more of that spice on the nose. It's only a little bit though. Wow, well, yeah. Now, um. I'm a big Glen Farkless fan uh, for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, it's the first distillery I ever visited. And I visited first when I was five years old. Um, we went on a holiday up to Scotland and uh, my dad wanted to go to a distillery. So he went to Glen Farkless and uh, went around. Um, me and my little brother ran around the gift shop at the end. Well, I think my, my brother was two at the time. So he was probably sort of hobbling around the, uh, the gift shop at the time. And my dad went into the tasting room and uh, was probably fed a vast quantity of Glen Farkless. He was rolled into the car, driven home, sat on the sofa and slept in our little holiday cottage we were staying in. But um, we then bought a timeshare uh, up in Scotland. So had the same week every year up in February. Uh, so the next year we went back to Glen Farkless and my dad went to the tasting room and didn't do the tour. My brother and I did the tour again. My mum sat in the car reading a book, um, rolled my dad into the car. We drove home. He slept on the sofa back in the holiday cottage. We did that for a few years in a row to the point that my little brother and I had been told could basically give the tour at Glen Farkless. Um, so two precocious children sort of running around going, is this the mash tun? This is where the distillation happens and all this sort of thing. I've still got somewhere out the back. I've got a Glen Farkless tie, but it's a child's Glen Farkless tie, which you know, goes to about here on me now. I, I sort of try and tie it. Yeah, so I... I always have like this incredible fondness of Glen Farkless. You know, my first big whiskey that um, I started drinking was Glen Farkless 105. And that's when I discovered that whiskey could be high strength um, and actually nice. But yeah, really sort of interesting uh, distillery, you know, properly family owned uh, to this day. You know, it's, um, George Grant tells lots of lovely stories. Um, many of them 
which he probably shouldn't tell. Uh, but at the same time, uh, one of my uh, favorite ones of his is um, as a child going to the family graveyard because they have a little plot nearby, you know, being an old sort of like local family. Uh, and every single gravestone for the male side of the family has either John or George written on it. Uh, that's um, him and his dad, which is slightly freaky when you're a child and you go to you know, the family, you know, graveyard and find every single person's name every gravestone's got either your name or your dad's name on it um, they're, they're, they're not being the most creatively uh, creative of naming it's just being john and george alternating um for the whole sort of like you know 100 almost 200 years of the distillery's life it's uh quite impressive but they're really nice guys and um yeah they make really good whiskey i thought your story was going to go that you learned how to drive at five years old i thought that's what you were going to say <laughs> you need to drive back after the distillery. Oh, I think, how old am I now? I am 43 uh, and I do not know how to drive. So, <laughs> I, I remember when I first came out to the US uh, when I was 21 for my training, for my, for my job, I used to work for an American company. So I used to, you know, come out to the US quite often. So my first four or five weeks training, they said, well, do you want to hire a car? It's like, I, I can't drive. It's like, oh, did you lose your license? No, I just don't know how to drive. So you can drive, but don't want to. No, I don't know how to drive. Uh, entire lack of understanding. Because you guys in the US, everybody knows how to drive. Yeah, yeah that's you, you just know how to drive. In, in New York City, m maybe you don't drive sort of thing so much. But I moved to London when I was eighteen. Uh, I did ten lessons before I got here. Um, and uh, let's just say me and the driving instructor decided that we part ways and we would just never talk of it again. I've been in London ever since, and I've never had a chance really or a need to learn how to drive. And uh, it does mean that if I go to Scotland, I do tell people, oh, no, unfortunately, I can't drive. It looks like you'll have to do the driving. I'll just sit in the back and do the drinking. It's fine. So, <laughs> Yeah, unfortunately, I did not learn how to drive when I was five. I, I learned how to give a distillery tour, which is hard. Oh, so what do we reckon? What do we think of this? Beautiful. Yeah, I don't have as much experience with Glen Farkless as you do, but this is a little more herbal and grassy than I'm used to expecting from a Farkless. Yeah, very much so. It's, it's a bit of a style thing that we often push for. And if you try our exclusives, we, we have at the moment a 15 and a 21 year old, uh, at 100, 100 old school UK proof and 95 proof UK proof. And both of those aren't just all cast. They have that little herbal note, that little bit of grassiness in there. Um, we've had younger ones as well. And we've always tried and make sure we keep a little bit of that freshness in there. Cause that is that for us, that's the, that's Glen Farkless. And while you can get some, you know, the 21 year old Glen Farkless you can just buy off the shelf is a great whiskey, but it is a great whiskey that is mostly about all the sherry cast. This, we just try and make sure we don't lose the fact that it is Glen Farkless still. Thanks. I think this is a lovely whiskey. I, I, I picked up something too that Richard's some tea. I thought there's maybe like cocoa shavings. There's something in there that was just sticking out that I couldn't, it, it's definitely unique. There's something there that I, I kept going after. I put quite a bit of water in it. It's still holding up, which is quite nice because uh, it definitely, that's, what more, that's a more cocoa-y side. Definitely sort of like pops out a little bit as well. So Billy, I have a question about um, how you pick then from this vast inventory of casks that Sakinda has. So presumably a lot of them don't, like not every Glen Farkless that you've got is going to meet that um, description you just gave. Does that mean you're, um, you're selling on the ones that you don't like or, uh, or putting them into blends or? It, it all depends on what projects are out there and what projects mm -hmm. are in the future, you know, if it's one which doesn't fit the spec that we're after for a certain project, it'll be put to one side for another project potentially. It might be sold. If it's be not something that we're ever going to want to use, we might sell it on. If it's something where we think if we re-rack this into a different cask, that might bring it to where we want it to be. We might do that. You know, those are the, the Freud's I mentioned earlier on, which I said I remember re-racking them back uh, sort of like 10 years ago. We decided to experiment. So some of them went into fresh bourbon casks, some went into refill bourbon casks. The casks they were in just weren't very good casks. They weren't giving the, the quality we wanted, the flavors we wanted. Some went into PX, 
and I've tried some of those since, and I suspect some of you guys have as well. You know, our older Lafroigs we've released in the last few years, absolutely insanely good. Uh, a load went into Madeira. Um, those ones, not so many of them have come out because they were a little bit more. Mm, some work really well. Others, when vatted with bourbon casts, work really well. Again, they become sort of like components within vattings and, and blends. So yeah, there's there's always something we can do with the whiskey. You know, if a whiskey's bad, which is quite rare, then we might sell it on to somebody who doesn't care so much. You know, if, you know, if someone's doing a, a vatting of a thousand casks, then a couple of casks which don't have the great the greatest of character, that's fine. You know, they'll just get lost in there and help bulk it out, and it will just be be fine in the in the overall mix. But that's not the scale we work at, so you know we can't do that sort of thing. But yeah, they choosing the cast is difficult, and one of the things that's quite shocking is when you wander into uh, Ollie's tasting room that he has in our office at the moment, and you just see a table entirely covered with glasses and bottles and it'll have like 200 samples out and it'll just have an a4 sheet in front of him and it'll just be going blah, blah, blah. and he'll just nose and taste at speed across like 200 whiskeys trying to pull out the ones that he needs to go back and look at again the ones that need to just be left for a while and and he does the same thing when we do when they go down to the uh, the blending line when they do like a vatting for something like port Askeg or one of our bigger twe whiskeys uh, Ollie will, actually, will often go up there and taste on the on the line and will go down the cast as they are dumped and try the whiskey straight from the cast to see whether it's fitting what they want because they can't taste absolutely everything down in the uh, in the, sort of the blending room. Yeah, so it, it's a lot of tasting and it's a lot of planning. It's the big one. And this is the thing with whiskey in general. You know, if you have to wait at least three years before whiskey's whiskey, most of the time you're waiting 8, 10, 15, 20 years. And so having lots of spreadsheets saying, in a few years time we should do this is uh is very very useful yeah i i'm i'm fortunate in that i get to try some of these things on the way there uh, i occasionally get to help out selecting casks but uh yeah every now and again i see ollie's spreadsheet and uh, i am scared so <laughs> so a bit of water and a bit of time this gets really nice and green on the nose But still, like uh, eating sort of like a fruitcake dipped in chocolate almost on the uh, on the palate. Yeah, we assume this is all Oloroso. Is this all Oloroso, or do you not? <coughs> I assume so. It's a single cask, so I'm assuming it's uh, it's as far as I know, it's not being re-racked. And generally, if it's going far, because it's Oloroso. Although, the distinguishing what that is is not quite as easy you know oloroso that's used to season these casks these are all seasoned casks if it's a sherry cask in the scotch whiskey industry and someone hasn't made a massive thing about it being a solera cask it's a seasoned cask and has been since the 1980s i've been down to uh Welver where they make these casks uh it's not in the sherry triangle so these are legally in the eyes of the conseil regulador who look after sherry they're not necessarily casks of sherry but there's some legal shenanigans and hand waving and addresses of offices that go on to make sure it's all right. But also the wine is young Oloroso. So if you tried, you know, Oloroso that has been matured and come out of a Solera after, you know, a few years, it's very, very different, different to the wine that goes into these casks. This stuff is like fresh wine, um, which is, you know, not really had that time to pick up that big, rich, dark sort of Oloroso character. Um, so it's being seasoned with a very different thing to what you might think of as being Oloroso. So it's all a little bit weird and wonderful. And, you know, people sort of, I remember people always sort of saying, I have to drink more sherry. But I need to make sure the whiskey industry has more casks. It's like, yeah, they're not using that sort of sherry most of the time. It's very, very different stuff. But it does still create the flavors in the cask and in the wood. So a lot of it's the wood, a lot of it is the, uh, the contents, but it's not just the contents. Billy, do we know if Clem Farkless is using American oak with the, the sherry season barrels? Because I get a lot of like citric, um, you know, very orange notes with this, uh, this barrel in particular. They use a mix. Um, we don't know whether this is American or uh, European. I can see this being American very much. So you say that sort of more sort of like orangey sort of character, those sort of fresher notes coming through rather than that sort of darker, big spice sort of berry fruit that you sometimes get with European oak. But no, they, they use a mix. When I was down there, um, Miguel Martin of Jose Miguel Martin, the people who, who run the uh, the bodega, 
he was showing off all of his uh, American oak he had stacked up in the in the uh, in the yard, drying nicely. You know, he was very very proud of his American oak casks, and then complained a lot about how European oak was really annoying, um, because it's uh, yeah American oak grows very very tall and straight, whereas European oak is very very gnarly and sort of like wavy. So trying to get a consistent board out of a European oak tree is a lot more difficult than out of an American oak tree. And the way they, uh, they actually fire the they have like the these sort of flame pits they use to sort of toast the inside of the cast and heat them so they can bend the staves. They're all fueled by the offcuts of wood. And uh, a lot of the time, the American oak stuff is fired using European oak because they have a lot more offcuts of European oak, despite it being significantly more expensive. So yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if there's American oak. Uh, ben Fox has been very happy to use American oak um, sherry casks for decades, you know, going back into the 60s and before. All right. Well, shall we? Shall we uh, try another whiskey? Cool. Right, this, this one is one which I'm actually quite impressed by. Um, I can't really tell you much story about this because we don't know loads of story. But this is our blended Scotch whiskey, 41 years old. Aurora aldehyde. And aldehydes are the sort of like um, the nuttier sort of like um, woodier sort of notes you often find in whiskies. And so it sort of fits a little bit with this because it's a, a whiskey with a bit of age on it. So every now and again you see me looking confused and typing things into my keyboard, it's because my computer keeps on locking. And so you guys will disappear off the screen and yeah, anyway, I'm back again. So this whiskey is a blended whiskey. Um, this is uh, the result of one of the, uh, the big distillers doing a project to make an old blended whiskey. And so what they did was about, I can't remember exactly how long ago it was now, I think just over a decade ago, I think it was 11, 12 years ago, they created an old blend. So a mixture of sherry casks and other casks, I think predominantly sherry casks, some grain and some malt, and they vatted it all together and then re-racked it into individual sherry casks to marry. At which point in time, we don't know exactly what happened, but the project didn't happen. It did not get bottled or vatted back together again. And those casts were sold off uh, to a lot of independents. They went on the market over the last couple of years and a few independent bottlers have grabbed them. So this is, if you see some of these whiskies, which are about 40 years old blended whiskies, they're all from the same stock. However, they're individual casks of the same stock that have been maturing separately to each other for more than a decade. So they've all sort of diverged from that initial point when it was about sort of 20, late 20s, early 30s years old. So this is an the old blend. You're not allowed to say. We just don't know. Okay. Yeah. I think this is, the, this is the mysterious Edrington stock. That's what I'm saying. Um, we think it's that one, um, but it's not sold to us with that sort of tag on it. So it's very much just trying to work out based on you know, hints and clues we have in the industry. And the other thing is that when people talk about the Edrington stock, often people say, oh, Edrington, does that mean it's got a load of McAllen and Highland Park in? To which the answer is probably not. <laughs> you know, the, the blenders don't just use their own whiskies. You know, blenders use whiskey from across Scotland. All the different companies have reciprocal agreements. So they swap new make casks you know, right back in the day. Um, that's the reason why Bunnahaven has so much random stuff in its warehouse. They swap Bunnahaven for a lot of other things back in time. Yeah, this has probably got a load of Tam Do in it because um, back then Edrington owned Tam Do, I think, or Highland Distillers owned Tam Do, and they have a load of stock from that, which was their core sherried whiskey they used rather than Macallan because Macallan they could use a single malt. And it's all these logistical and um, commercial things that come together about what they can use as well as flavor profile. So this is just old blended whiskey, but it's a single cask of blended whiskey, which has been marrying for a good long while. To the point where it's basically a secondary maturation was like it's a sherry, sherry finished blended whiskey almost single cast sherry finished and this is starting to pick up some of those really old notes that you get in whiskey and this is the moving on into aldehyde territory but also moving on from the previous two so the, the bunahaven had some nice fresh notes in there it had those sort of like you know orchard fruits still there the glen farkas had some grassiness in there still but was definitely getting more towards that sort of fruit cakey side of things this is now bringing in what they call in the cognac world rancio. You know, this is the this is forest floors. This is old oak. This is polished tables. 
all that sort of thing, as well as having that big fruitiness. For this sort of whiskey, you know, how does it fit into the mysterious sort of whiskey exchange spirit forward thing? It doesn't really so much, but at this point in time, we're all about managing age and managing age effects and the effects of age on the spirit. So a lot of this is oxidation, which brings out all those lovely sort of like um, those sort of nuttier uh, sort of dried fruit and that sort of forest flory sort of character. But it's all the different spirits that are in there have created that base for those flavors to build on that fruitiness that's hiding in there. Those older sort of like um, sort of just generally older notes, as well as the wood then doing its thing as well. See, it almost smells cognac like on the nose to me. Yeah, I was going to say on that nose, I was getting cognac, you know, almost like a rum and coke. Mm -hmm. And it's that, 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 that really old oxidized oak notes. And that's where we get that sort of combination, you know. The rum and coke thing is there's a sweetness in here, almost like a brown sugary sweetness, which you often find in cokey things. And then that really old wood old fruit and from that that you find in, in old cognac um this is a style of whiskey i really quite like i'm not generally the biggest sherry cask fan but this sort of sherry cask when it starts getting really old as i said before this is the problem of having uh Sikinder as your boss is that you end up drinking things like this and then realizing you can't afford them anywhere near as much as you'd like <laughs> bill you mentioned something interesting that um are most blended whiskeys especially at this age blended and then married for you know maybe like a year or two versus this one that's been you know married together for a really long time um it depends on who's making them generally the the rule of thumb is leave them in the vat as long as you can and often depending on what the project is they may put them back out into casks again and often they'll be dead casks these ones are a quite active cast they were put back into but yeah, that marriage time, that time for allow it to integrate, to allow it to sort of like think about what it's done and just calm down and come together. That's, um, yeah, something that generally people will try and, let's say the rule really much is just as long as you possibly can. And unfortunately, in the wonderful world of logistics, and so one of the things I end up seemingly doing, this is something that uh, Ollie Chilton from Elixir Distillers does as well, is uh, remove all the romance from whiskey by telling you about the logistics of a bottling line and things like that. But the, the problem is, if, you're, if you've got a whole row of vats and you need to get things bottled, sometimes you can't leave it in the vat for as long as you want. You know, you want it to leave it there for six months in a year, but they need the vat for something else and they put you in a bottle. So we, we always try and vat things for as long as possible. And that's one of the reasons why people put them back into carts. You can stick them in cars for as long as you want. You know, it's, it's up to you to warehouse it again. So yeah, generally people will try and leave it to to rest for as long as possible, and if not, they might stick it out to cars. But for this sort of long, generally it's not deliberate. Oh dear, sorry, excuse me, bit of a yawn there. So it's half past eight. It's getting late for me these days. So, well, this is absolutely fantastic so far. And anybody here that's doesn't join a lot of tastings. Um, don't worry if there's a lot of things that don't make sense. I only understand half of what we're talking about. But the first time I joined a tasting, I didn't understand anything, but that was why I was so infatuated, just learning um, so much. And straight from you, Billy, this has all been super fabulous so far. I've learned a lot about um, these, particular, these particular whiskeys, your thought process, whiskey exchange process, um, and also about some of these other distilleries that is quite unique. So this is all super, super valuable information and really. Oh, but also if anybody's got any questions, I, I'm, I'm sort of like answering questions and talking about stuff, which is like, you know, from if you, if you have any questions at all, whether, you know, no matter how simple or how complicated they are, throw them my way. One of the things I try and do with whiskey is, is just, there are so many different levels you can talk about these things. And, you know, I, I spent the last 20 years learning all about this stuff and horrible blatant plug. One of the things about my book that I wrote is uh, it's this big. Um, it is a very, very sort of like it's a beginner's guide. It's got some interesting bits in there. But the whole point of it is, is that you don't need to have to learn a bit about whiskey. You don't need to have 20 years, whatever. You can pick up little bits at a time. And the main thing about this book is that um, I made sure I had two pages of further reading at the end. And this is you know, a bibliography of all the stuff that I've read over the past, well, not everything, but a lot of the things I've read over the past 20 years to learn about whiskey. There's so much you can learn. I'm still learning every single day. You know, it's like you're saying, James, you know, I, I go to, you know, 
I sit in meetings and things like that and sit there and smiling as I learn new stuff from other people and then have no idea what people are talking about, make notes and have to go and research afterwards. And that's just meetings at work. You know, I'm, a, I'm allegedly one of the geeks at work. So, you know, it's a, it's a world where there's just, lots more stuff. Just don't learn on Facebook. <laughs> What's that? Do I still? Don't learn too much on Facebook, though. Surprisingly large amounts, often about how much I hate people. But apart from that, so uh... <laughs> no. Unfortunately, I'm one of these people, and it comes from my back. Uh, I, I used to be a computer programmer. I hated the idea of people being, people being wrong on the internet, and so unfortunately, I spend a large amount of time on Facebook groups explaining to people that they're being wrong on the internet. I try and do it nicely, though, and be polite. You know, I am very British at that. You know, in the, at the end of the day, so but yeah. No, if anybody's got any questions at all, you know. No matter how I, what they are, something just let me know. Um, there is nothing. Oh, what's up? Yeah, I got one, Billy. You know, we've looked at now all the heights and esters, and I think you know when it comes to our back, it's called uh, phantom phenol, right? Something like that. Are often some of these compounds found together? Which one aren't found together? Which one, you know, you can't find at all in this, in in one and the same whiskey? All of the ones which we've got here, you know, congener is a little bit of a hand wavy one. They're all congeners. So congener is like you know, the, the umbrella mm -hmm. term. But aldehydes, esters, and phenols, uh, you'll find in all whiskey. All whiskey will have those three compounds, you know, those three types of compound in, in different levels. So if you have a whiskey that is really nutty and multi-forward, that might have more aldehydes in it. If you have a whiskey that's a massive fruit bomb, that'll be a lot more ester-focused. If you have something that's phenolic, that's going to be generally um, a lot more peaty or maybe spicy. Um, so peat smoke, we'll get onto it in a bit, but peat smoke and clove, those two flavors are both phenols. And so th these aren't just individual, they're whole wide sort of like you know, families of flavor, but they're all always in whiskey. Are they, are, they are they determined by the cut? Because I think like the phenols come over earlier, I and mean, the phenols come over later, and the esters come over earlier, or is that just it, every single part of the process influences what you know flavor compounds are around? So, in your from your barley, depending on how you treat your barley, you might end up with more of any of the precursors of all of them. When you do your fermentation, how you use your yeast and how you allow it to ferment will create more precursors when you do your distillation not only when you do your cuts where you choose what things come through the still but how you run the still one of my favorite things i need to look i'm, I'm not a chemist i'm a failed physicist let alone chemist you know i'm, I'm nowhere near being a chemist but uh, the one reaction i do know about a little bit is uh, the fisher reaction which is when you take a fatty acid and an alcohol and you combine them and they create an ester so if you have a lot of fatty acids from your fermentation, which you're allowed to come through into through distillation, and you then cut late, so you have a load of fusel alcohols around, so you have a slightly dirty whiskey in your cask with fatty acids, over time, fatty acids in the, uh, the fusels will come together and make fruity flavors. So something like Bernahaven in the olden days, oh, sorry, uh, Glen Scotia, which is well known for being slightly dirty in some of its, uh, its eras, those sort of dirtier flavor compounds can actually turn into fruit. So when you find older Glen Scotias, you often find them being quite fruity. So it's, it's all about how you, every single part of the process, you know, and then when you stick it in wood, you then have all these precursor compounds and compounds floating around in a wooden porous vessel. And that's even more stuff happening. You know, it's just, I think I'm, I'm Mark Rainier from uh, now from Waterford distillery, formerly of Brooklady distillery. Uh, is a man who I disagree with on almost every single thing in the world. Um, I'm very, very pleased he exists. I very much like the fact that he's, he's a very, very charismatic guy. Um, I've never met him in real life. I, I sort of don't want to because I suspect that we won't like each other. And I like the fact that I don't know if I like him or not. Um, well, I, just, I don't agree with a lot of things he said, but one thing he did say, and I, I even wrote this in my book in the end, was when people talk about how flavor comes from stuff, People often talk about how 60% of the flavor or 70% of the flavor comes from the cask. And his quote is 100% is the only number you should ever use about that. 100% of the whiskey in the cask is affected by the cask. And that's when you, when you talk about flavors and how these things all come together, it's everything affects everything else. Every part of the process is part of the influence of creating the flavor. And it's, it's um, yeah, so... These, these three different types you know, of flavor, they're all in here and they come from 
everywhere in the process. And it's just tight. This is the reason why whiskey is so fascinating and why two cars sat right next door to each other in the same warehouse, filled on the same day from the same run, can taste so different because tiny variation, it's still chaos theory thing, you know, butterfly flaps its wings, your whiskey tastes different 20 years later. You know, it's, it's properly, you know, small variation can lead to great change. Um, yeah, it, it's basically, it's, it's magic. It's magic and witchcraft, you know, which is the reason why the distillers can still make so much money out of selling incredibly rare single casts, which taste amazing, which they can never replicate and have no idea how they made. You know, one of the notes that I get in this is kind of a, um, like a furniture polish note. And I, I, you know, it's one of those things that I love, like that kind of the varnish you get or like the old lacquered wood. And you tip it, from my experience, I've only really gotten that in, in older whiskey, you know, looking at like 60s and 70s vintage. Um, you don't really get that, that note in, in, in you know, newer makes. Um, is there a reason why, or is that just the, just the old whiskey versus new whiskey or kind of curious where that varnish note comes from and why it's so it's more prevalent in that older whiskey. That's age. That, that really, you know, that's not even, that's not the makes being different. That is just, that's one of the things that time and a cask will give you. I was talking about oxidized flavors. Mm. This is that, that varnish, you know, that proper, old wood that has sat there for ages you know, le you know leaning in a little bit to like i say about forest floors and those sort of things that's that's time you, you can't accelerate that you can't get that faster so the whiskies that are being made at the moment you know 20 2060 if, if, if we're still about to try them we'll be able to taste the hopefully these sort of notes popping up in those whiskies as well and it is, it's just really a factor of time. And if you, if you get to try older and older whiskeys, I'm really fortunate. I've tried um, up to the, uh, the Glenlivet 80, you know, the, this um, most recently released oldest production whiskey out there. And it's got this in spades. It really has. It's properly has that big old wood and it just builds and builds and builds with more time in the cask. So we want to talk about cognac, you know, because cognac, they do like doing really old ones. And if you like that flavor, have a look at old cognac. Oh, and even better, old Armagnac, because it's a lot cheaper. Yeah. So, <laughs> I have had, had plenty. It's good. <laughs> oh, good. That's all right. Just making sure. Yeah, yeah. No, it, it, it's just age. That's, that's one of the things that, you know, I always talk about how young whiskey is not necessarily better than old whiskey and, you know, vice versa. Age just is another thing which creates flavor. And in this case, it creates this flavor. And it's quite a nice flavor. So, you know, it's... Uh, Another reason why uh, old whiskey is expensive, not only because it's been in the cast for a long time, but, you know, it makes things you just can't get any other way. What's fun is to try old, young whiskeys. So if you try like a 10-year-old from the 60s, you'll see the difference. And that's definitely time in the cast. Yeah, but well, you I'm know, it's funny, to... like, like, like there, there have been, you know, like if you look at it, like Lagavulin 12-year white horse, you know, that that's, you know, a younger whiskey, but I think there's an elegance there. And I do get some burnished notes out of that whiskey and it's, it's pretty young, you know, but um, you don't get that with a modern 12. I think some of that is also bottle aging. You sometimes get those sort of most more varnishy notes from something being in a bottle for a long time. OBE is a, a wide range of different flavor effects you get after sitting in glass for a long time. And seals are never perfect, especially on those Lagavulins. You know, they're all screw cap, but they're old screw caps, you know. Yeah. And also just being sat there for so long, open up the bottle, you know, suck in some air, oxidize nice and quick. I suspect they were a little bit, a little bit less varnishy uh, back when they were first bottled. But again, also there'll just be some changes in production, which might have brought those notes out faster. You know, it's a, mm -hmm. uh, cast back then with this is the weird thing we have is everything was different back in the day and everything is different in the future and everything will be different in the future so trying to sort of pinpoint which little pieces of it have changed is difficult because the answer is everything yeah yeah hmm. but fortunately whiskey now is also nice like whiskey back then was also nice so fortunately we're safe still there is still nice whiskey, nice whiskey to drink if that goes away that's when we're in trouble but i think we should be all right for a while <laughs> is uh, still available for sale i think uh billy i think i saw yeah that. that's i'm quite surprised by that i thought this one had disappeared um it did for a little bit uh, what's yes. the price on this one what's the retail james yeah it is oh come on it's 200 something us 230 that's not so bad at all that's great that's 200 pounds x vat i made it yeah whiskey 300. 
It's very annoying. Oh, 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 here we go. Finally found it. Yeah. So nice dainty blend. 240 pounds. So yeah, it's probably about yeah, 200 something dollars when you take off VAT. So sorry, having the website here in front of me and saying currency US dollar is shipped to America. $275 for this one. Including $300 shipping? Uh, no, you have to, yes. Yeah. <laughs> on a quick note on the shipping front, because it's, it's absolutely ridiculous what you guys pay. The reason why is, you know the reason why. You've seen the, your weird import laws. You know what it's like. So no, it's, it's a constant annoyance at the moment, especially for us now post-Brexit, because everywhere in Europe is the same. It's just so expensive to ship anywhere. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm looking at the moment, shipping books, literally just books. So no, no taxes involved whatsoever. For me to ship uh, 64 books, just like two little parcels like this, um, UPS to Dallas because I've got some friends of mine over there who want to send them out to people. Uh, that's going to cost me eight, that's going to be eighty dollars just for two boxes of books. So yeah, it's very pretty, annoying. That's actually pretty cheap compared to like what other stuff costs. Oh, I was really impressed oh, yeah. by it. I got it for eighty dollars because the, the first quote was one hundred and twenty. I was like, it's only sixty four, but that's two dollars a book. That's ridiculous. But yeah. If we can ship from the UK at 30, 30 US dollars a bottle, that's actually, pr that's pretty, that's the going rate pretty much. Yeah, it, it's, it's gone up and up over the years. You know, it used to be that we just, we had some deals with people in the US who are shipping legally still, you know, because again, you guys have all your weird state laws, which make it really difficult to get booze in. But the states have been cracking down, the licensing fees are going up. Uh, the, the guys who are doing the shipping, they have been increasing their fees. Um, in part because a lot of them seem to get shut down quite regularly, which they forget to fill in a form somewhere and end up, you know, getting done for it. It's a, we have, it's a constant annoyance. Um, but at the same time, we, we have, we have guys at work who really know what they're doing when it comes to this and constantly searching and finding better ways of doing it. But yeah, it's an absolute nightmare. So my first time on Isla, I left 10 bottles on the Isla at the house that I stayed at. They put it in the post office, a hundred dollars to ship 10 bottles. That was the last year they could do that. Yeah, well, that was a little while ago, though, wasn't it? Yes, 12 years ago. <laughs> yeah, it's um, it's getting really annoying. But um, even within the UK, you know, like uh, James, you were saying, you, you're finding the, the various fun ways of shipping little bottles around the country. In the UK, we have the same thing. You know, We have a maximum of, um, I think it's a maximum of two litres in any parcel, um, but a maximum of two bottles. Yeah. So... I can ship two one liter bottles or these two three CLs. There is no difference in the eye of the post office. It's just totally crazy. Um, but no. You yes, get so one big bottle, little bottles inside a big bottle. We, we come up with many interesting ideas, and the general way seems to be just don't say anything, stick it in the post, and it'll be fine. But um, like a yeah, ship in a bottle, uh, just put the bottles in one big bottle. <laughs> Dear. no it's just uh it's a very weird one but, but no um it does mean that we can still ship out to you guys and that's the big thing we went through so many stages of not being able to so we finally can again so that's a little bit up to the price of the bottles but you do save a load on tax so yeah it can still help work out in the end oh, this blended is amazing it's uh there's been a lot of 40 year old blends that came out the last well they always come out but like the last year and uh, Caden Heads had a, a couple, of, I think, at least one or two. But uh, it's the same vat. The what? The what? It's the same, the same initial vat from Edgerton. Yeah, it, it basically it seems to be the same. It's the same vat, and then it's just different individual casts. I think a lot of it. I'm just the reason I'm looking around is because uh, I know I've got um, I've got a Vega here on the shelf. It's one of the 28 year old Vegas from um, North Star Spirits. But uh, Ian from North Star, his first batch or the first whiskey he released was an old, uh, an old sort of like late thirties um, uh, blended whiskey. Hmm. And so basically, he bought a nice big parcel of it and then sold on bits and pieces of it, and that funded a lot of his other operations. And so there's a lot of these sort of bits and pieces out there, but all the casts that come out of it are different. They're similar. And they definitely vary because after 10 years, you know, a quarter of the, the whiskey's life in its own little cask, it's definitely changed. But there's a load of them out there and they're down to, you know, say, you know, here I've got a couple from Ian. 
uh, a 28 year old Vega and a 31 year old Sirius. You know, so there's all these different whiskies out there. This is at the best blended there. Yeah, they're both they're both blended malts. These ones rather than blends. But yeah, more and more um, companies are realizing that they have stuff in their warehouses for projects that didn't work or just didn't come about. And so they're going onto the market and people are snapping them up uh, for really good prices. And so we can end up doing a 41 year old blend for under $300, which is quite ridiculous when you think about it. I, I had so, the, uh, the 40 year Vega. Keep an eye out. I, I had the 40 year Vega a few days ago. And um, I could say that this uh, 41 year blended is has a lot more going on in my opinion there's more depth yeah, there's more more of the older notes you'd expect out of a 40-year whiskey i remember the 40-year-old vega when it came out being really good whiskey sort of thing but yeah the the, the, the state of the art of that style of really weirdly for something which has been so long in the making there's been a definite push over the last few years of people saying right we need to choose the right ones and you know people doing more work on finishing more work on trying to work out the exact moment when to bottle it you know there's a lot more we can do with these and you know the, the final finessing of the whiskey is something that people are paying, paying a lot more attention to because there's a lot more competition these days but that original four-year-old vega for the price it was i can't remember it was like something stupid like you know 150 pounds or like oh, yeah. it was no, it was it was cheap it was good it was old it was unlike anything else we'd seen and it's helped to Ian start North Star Spirits and you know create a fantastic bottling company. You know, it's from, but it also started this craze. And uh, now we're on to sort of like bottling 41 year old blended whiskeys. It's, uh, you know, I like it. I'm a big fan of, of a blended whiskey anyway. Uh, as a style, this is very malt heavy. This is, this is not a lot of grain in here. You know, some of these we've looked at and said, are there any blends because somebody filled in the paperwork wrong? It's that sort of thing. You know, um, we've had some of those in the past. We've imported what we know to be a single malt and the uh, the paperwork from germany from the bottler who has taken it out to germany to do stuff with and sent it back again they put the wrong category on the paperwork and all of a sudden our single malt has become a blend and the price is just halved you know it's just yes yeah, things like that happen as well in the industry it's, it's a we, we make out that we're nice and modern all that sort of thing at the same time as trying to pretend to be old-fashioned and a lot of the time it's the uh, the whiskey is modern the paperwork's old-fashioned very annoying but we do get stuff like this still knocking around in warehouses and a uh, well uh, mark watt from uh what whiskey formerly can heads famously says you know whiskey is not found in warehouses it's found in spreadsheets um you know you don't walk around a warehouse and find a car so everybody's forgotten no you go for a spreadsheet and realize that nobody bottled the thing uh, they're going through spreadsheets and finding lots of weird and wonderful things they're suddenly realizing there is now a market for so hopefully you should see lots of nice things like this popping up over in the future Probably from our side. I'm fairly certain we've got a few more cars knocking around in the back of uh, Sekinda's spreadsheet. So, uh. um, well, Billy, we want to be very respectful of your time, and yeah, we should probably uh, crack onto uh, another whiskey. So, uh. yeah, should we start pouring the last one? And can I ask you a segue question into that? Um, as we as we pour the Arbeg, yep. the, you mentioned this a couple times um, just now, talking about the blended, and so we're we're already like a few years past this whole whiskey explosion and the, the cost skyrocketing and demand outweighing, you know, supply and there's a scarcity element and there's a lot of uh, bottlers that have taken advantage of that. Others have not. And it's been kind of all over the place. Do you think that there is going to be a growing demand for things like the one we just had, like blended? We're going to an art bag, which is sells out hard to find, especially in the IBs. But do you think that for blended for, for uh, malt, blended malts for grain, do you think that there is going to be another explosion for that coming as well? Because usually when those come out, you can still find them. They are still for sale. Months later, you can still find them. Do you think that the, the consumer's tastes are getting to that point where they're getting a newfound infatuation for those other types of whiskeys? When you say consumer, that's a very, very wide group. And so for the, for the average person who buys you know, whiskey from the liquor store, no. Here in the UK, you know, people who buy whiskey from the supermarket, they're, they're, they're never going to go and buy themselves a 41 year old blend they're not going to find a blended malt they're barely going to find single malts you know but within the whiskey community within the geek community within the sort of connoisseur specialist community as we've seen with the rise of grain whiskey as we've seen when people buy more blended malt whiskey um yeah i think people are starting to realize that these are potentially great whiskeys at good prices 
So I think we'll see definitely more concern with these going down the line. Um, yeah, I, I it, again, it's the sort of thing of, you know, I, I've known about a load of these for a while and been jumping on them when I can. And we've been trying to tell people, but eventually people then, you know, jump on it as well. It's just the slower sort of take up because there is, as ever, a little bit of snobbery, but also a little bit of lack of experience in a lot of places. You know, how many of you folks have tried a 41 year old blended whiskey, which was, you know, single cast blended whiskey, which had been battered, well, sat marrying for the past 10 years? You know, it's not a thing you try every day, you know, and that idea and that concept, as people learn more about it, I think we'll see a load more. This last whiskey, and there's two reasons why I wanted this one last. One is because it's a certain style of peat that would just wipe out everything else before it. And I didn't want to try something like the, the 41 year old after it because it'd just be a little bit delicate. Um, but also because it is just quite punchy in general. It's, a, it's a, a whiskey that is very different in style to everything else, isn't part of that progression of the last three. And uh, yeah, this is a, a good tasting ender of a whiskey. Yeah, it's, it's sort of thing which may uh, make it a little bit more difficult for you to try other things afterwards. And it might even hold up to the end of a cigar. How about that then, Matt? Looking after you. So small. <laughs> we sent Matt out of there. I put on those three glasses and for five seconds, I got really sick like I was going to throw up. Matt was like, I'm going to wear it the whole time. And I was like, go on the patio, oh, yeah. throw up. If you go throw up, throw it up out there. <laughs> we sent him out there. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I have sort of like run around the uh, the office with these on, but yeah, sitting here at the moment in the half darkness of my apartment, this does make me feel very ill. There we go. I've got a friend who used to do a load of stuff with um, with anaglyph glasses and anaglyph photography, and so I've got like pairs of cardboard ones all over my flat from where I used to do sort of like photography things with three D. I've never had proper shiny professional ones before, and just like so these. I don't have any photography stuff anymore that I do with them. Uh, you really these get took... ones that are red I, I've got loads of those. Yeah. Uh, these glasses took longer to source than anything else involved in the project. It was more difficult to get the glasses than the whiskey, the glass, and the labels. So, so what do you think of the whiskey? This is um, it's an art bag. It is. I grab the exact dates on it. It is a. 2001 aren't they to complete our sort of like you know selection of 2001 whiskies this is 28th of june 2001 distilled bottle on the 30th of august 2021 um it's 51.4 percent and this is very classic art bag and we're really pleased to actually have some art bag still we haven't run out yet um Sekinda, in classic fashion went i think i'll buy some cars of art bag <laughs> a little while back uh, unfortunately we still have some We've been bottling them every now and again across the different elixir distiller ranges, as well as occasionally for us as well. And when it comes to having something special, it. yeah, it's um, yes, it's always quite quite nice to have an Arbeck because there's so little out there independent bottle at the moment. Basically, back in '96, uh, I think it was when um, uh, LVMH came in and swooped in and bought Arbeck. Uh, sorry, Glen Morangy bought Arbeck before they were bought by LVMH. Um, they just try to get production up and running again. So they sold a few casts to people. So there's a few casts going out, but they stopped doing that. Um, basically, they needed all the whiskey for themselves. They just don't sell casts to independents anymore. So we're very fortunate to have got a few. There are a few more floating around out there, but they're so rare. And old Ardbeg, and these days, old Ardbeg is anything more than 10 years old, is uh, yeah, really you know, hard to find and hard to get hold of. And also, generally, um, one of the things about Ardbeg for me is that um, I like Ardbeg, excuse me, I like Ardbeg New Make. I like Ardbeg New Make a lot. I prefer Ardbeg New Make to any form of Ardbeg whiskey up until about the 10. You know, any of those younger ones, I just rather drink it straight off the still. I've got a friend of mine used to make limoncello with it, which was absolutely stunning. But this, you know, uh, this 2001 Ardbeg, this has got the beginnings of what makes older Ardbeg better. For me, you know, older Ardbeg, you know, it has that, you know, younger stuff, big and zingy, young and fresh. And I love that. But after a certain point, generally when it sort of hits its late teens, it suddenly softens. You still have that smoke in there quite a lot of the time. But you get this sweet fruitiness coming through as well. And while this is still very medicinal, this is probably for this sort of age, the, the most medicinal Ardbeg I've tried for a long time. But it still has that slightly sort of softer back end to it as well. 
I was surprised it was a sherry. Sorry, what was that? I was almost surprised it was a sherry because you still get the flavor. I think this one, if it is sherry, I think it's refill. Again, I don't have any, you know, much casting information on this one. Um, it's not first fill. Okay. If it, it might be refill, because it's got that sweetness mm -hmm. coming through. Maybe ex American oak as well. Yeah, I'm almost certainly American oak on this one, I would say. I'd be very surprised if it wasn't. It doesn't feel like a bourbon car, so it has that sort of like um, berry sweetness type thing, that sort of sultanery, raisiny thing in there, which makes me think refill sherry. Sorry, Peter, you, you, you saying something? I was going to say this is right up my alley. Like I've got a, a, a like an ABV sweet spot between 51 and 55. Like I can, I can handle much higher than that, but you know, anything peat 51, 55 is kind of citrusy, lemon, lime. Uh, it, it even, it even reminds me of a single malt of Scotland that, that they bottled just, I think last year or so 19 year old art bag. Um, it's, it's fantastic. Then again, I'm, I love everything pizza. Well, the thing for me is, you know, Arbeg often, I talk about, especially with a 10-year-old, how it's very, very minerally and how it's like, you know, lots of sea, sea spray in there for me and how I took, you know, all the different distillers are a different thing. This has got almost like a little bit of lefroig like a medicinal character to it for me as well. It's sort of dipping towards that a bit more than most Arbegs do for me. But as you say, strength-wise, it's, perfect it sits there it's not too hot it's still got that intensity of flavor in there as well uh, i'm gonna add a bit of water to it in a moment but it doesn't need it but i feel that potentially knowing this sort of art bag a little bit of water could you know with its age as well just open up make it even sweeter even more soft and rounded i think it's very mature i mean very mature at, at 20 years a, a lot of times you see those lagas and lafroys and art bags that get to the 25 year and they start to become much, much more gentler much more palatable. This one I think is there. It's really, really pleasing. And there's a lot of fruit that kind of hit, it's not like the sweetness that hits you right in the mouth. And then it starts to develop that smoke and that, that peat just comes good. But it's not a, I, I was asking Harold, I didn't think it was really a heavy peat. For me, it was kind of like light peat. I didn't think it was very strong or overtook the finish. You still get a lot of the spirit character throughout the finish. It doesn't have that. It, for me, it's got a lot of peat to it. It doesn't have very much smoke to it. Is the smoke has definitely rolled off over the years, but that peat character has sort of like become very complex. That's where the sweetness for me is coming from. It's got those earthy bits around the side, but it's, it's really for me the smoke that has disappeared. And you know, we often sort of talk about the difference between peat and smoke, and I think this is a really good example of that because it's not smoky, really. It is. It's a little bit of smoke in there, but it doesn't have that traditional big whack of like going bonfire smoke and barbecue smoke you get from an Arbeg. Yeah, it's not coming up like, through my nose and like, you know, that it's not that at all. It's not a refill bourbon smoke, definitely. Hey, I always kind of describe that as a soft smoke, you know, versus more of like a hard smoke. And I don't know if, if it's that versus the versus peat or not, but it's for me, this is like a really soft smoke that balances well with the sweetness. It's more, yeah, more it's like a highlight peat. Again, yeah. it's, it's so many different ways of, of talking about smokiness and all just flavor and whiskey in general you know for me there's um, a just even in the most smoky whiskies there's a divide between the smoky element and the element that the flavor that comes from the peat and it's whiskies like this that help me pull that apart because you, you can actually taste the peatier elements in here because as you say the, the smoke is so nice and soft and sort of you know to one side um, but you know things like um, if you look at some of the octomores which are just sillily smoky things you know they're, they're all about yeah, smacking as much phenols, as many sort of smoky compounds as you can do into the barley. There is also this peatier side that the fruit and the sort of the earthiness and that sort of other side to it, which is just separate to the smoke. And I never got that really in, in Octomons until I started trying things like this. And, you know, it was all sort of tied together. But at the same time, this is very, very soft smoke. And it is, it's really nice sort of way of sort of tasting an hard bag, which still tastes like hard bag. Mm -hmm. You know, it still has the right character, but it's just strange to have all that smoke sort of just dialed back has anybody tried the uh the rb 20 somethings and the more recent rb 25 i've, I've already began to try one of the 20 somethings but this has got some of that sort of idea to it as well yeah i wrote in my note that it kind of was reminiscent to the 21 but then maybe because that sticks in my mind because that's my favorite out of the out of the 20 somethings yeah that same was, here that's I, the I only one the... i tried 
I've had the 21, the 22, and the 23. And yeah, the 21 was the best for me. Yeah, so it's the only one I tried and it has, it was fruitier than this one. You know, that, that sort of smoke, I always talk about how smoke often seems to turn into fruit. I don't think it is necessarily turning into fruit. It's more a case of it dissipates as the fruit rises, not necessarily in the same sort of like, you know, thing, but it always seems to have that trade-off. And that Arbe 21, but yeah, perfect. I, I Yeah, one of my favorite Arbe's of recent memory. Maybe my favorite of recent memory. Maybe my favorite of any Arbe. I'm not entirely sure. I only, I only got one dram of it once. So... So Billy, based on the price point of this, I'm assuming that, uh, you know, Sukinder has had this barrel for a pretty long time. Um, yeah, I think so. I don't know exactly when we got these, but we've had them for, or it, we've been releasing them for a good four or five years. So, yeah, we, we have had we, about we, 10 or 15 years. Probably back much, much further. Yeah. As I say, you know, we haven't released very many young ones. He's, he's held on to them and I know we don't have very many um this is one of the last ones i think uh, and I, I know this because ollie who looks after the bottling for elixir distillers didn't seem to be that pleased that sakinda had chosen to bottle this for the whiskey show rather than leaving it for elixir distillers to bottle later on so but he's got a load of them for elements of Isla. he can't complain you know he's having most of them but yeah it's um again this no is whiskey. When, I, when, when i first got it i i, I did i I didn't understand it. I didn't really get it. I wrote my notes on it and went, you know, whatever. And I've gone back to it a couple of times since um, and gone, uh, no, I understand what I'm talking about now. And this, this is, yeah, it's, uh, again, that, that rolling off of some of the more smoky notes, which I didn't really get at first because I wasn't really thinking in the right sort of frame of mind for it. But yeah, it really comes you know, through as that sort of softer style with a load more fruit in it. It's, um, it's very nice. Yeah, what a great way to cap off this tasting. This is super nice. Start off really strong with the fruit bomb of this uh, really elegant art bag. Uh, again, it's, it's a sort of whiskey which you couldn't really put it anywhere else in the tasting, I don't think. If, if you put it earlier, other whiskeys wouldn't show so well and it wouldn't show so well. You know, now, it's such a contrast and shows a difference in style that you can get in Scotch whiskey. And this is one of the things I like about Scotch whiskey specifically, the style variation is so big. You know, The Ben Nevis through to this, there are things which tie them together, some of those fruitier notes and some of the sort of the feel and the character, but still they're just opposite ends of a spectrum of flavor at the same time. So the whiskey show, do you see people drinking the peated whiskeys early in the morning and you're just shaking your head? <laughs> like you're not going to be able to enjoy anything else here the whole day. Um, a lot of people I know, you know, very much sort of, you know, go for the peatier things at the end of the day. So you see the people on the art bag table, just sitting there tapping their fingers, you know, waiting for after lunch. I always used to make sure I went for the PT stuff early. So I go around doing my PT whiskeys, then I go and have my lunch, have a few glasses of water, then go back and try all the delicate ones in the afternoon when nobody else is around. So but then again, also, I, I'm quite good at jumping back and forth between peat and, you know, unpeated whiskey because I've, I've done this for a while. Um, but yeah, it is, you, you, you do see, especially at smaller shows, not so much a whiskey show because people are just all over the place all the time. There's a range of shows in the UK called the Whiskey Lounge and the Ard Bay table was always run by member of staff from the whiskey lounge rather than our bag themselves eddie who runs the show used to be a uh, brand manager for uh, glen morangy and our bag so they basically say eddie you do it you know all about this you, you know so he always gets you know me or one of the other guys helping out the show to do it and we just stand there for the first half of the show just drinking our bag and just have no, having nothing else to do there are worse things to have to do than sit around drinking our bag for half a, half a show though that's, that's a good thing about two days for old and rare. You can do peat in the morning, the second day or the first day, and still have a clean palate later. Yeah, and that's the thing. The, the whiskey show, one of the problems we always have is that people don't have enough time to go around everything. Um, I, can, I, I you'll, you'll see why I don't, I don't, I'm not specific about numbers in a bit, but um, we have a lot of whiskey there. And in two and a half days, we used to have a, a trade day. So people used to have three days if they could get in for the, uh, for the, the trade day as well. And even with three days, you couldn't get around half of what you wanted to try. You know, we have so much whiskey there and there is so much whiskey in Scotland and around the world. And you know, these days we throw in like a, a, a rum zone. And this year we had a flavor zone, which had everything from rum to shochu to tea. You know, it was just like a whole array of incredible drinks from around the world. So yeah, lots and lots of stuff to do. 
but um until this year i have run the whiskey show bottling stand every year so these whiskies and a load of other stuff bottled for us for the show and for the whiskey exchange has been my stand and it is the busiest stand at the show because everybody wants to try these whiskies and of course everybody wants to come and see me but mostly they want to try the whiskies um and uh yeah, this year I left it to uh, to my understudy, uh, Jason, who's our old and rare whiskey specialist at the moment in the office. And uh, at the end of the day, I was like, how do, you, how do you do this every year? They just keep on coming up and drinking all my whiskey. You know, and it's everybody at the show wants to come to the show bottling stand. So yeah, one of the most popular ones at the show. Um, so yeah, really glad this year. Again, we, we've had more people able to come over to the show this year. You know, we've had folks from all over the world turn up, but not everybody could come over. Not everybody's entirely happy about coming over yet. Um, but next year we'll be back again doing more virtual stuff as well as doing an in-person show and little bit by little bit hopefully we'll be able to get more of you guys over to see us again you know i say matt we, we expect to see you soon enough i'm sure you know the second that it's allowed you'll be uh, banging on the door yep yeah, get so, back yeah. Oh, unfortunately old, the old and rare show has been cancelled for next year it's going to be only um virtual again next year in uh, in february um, but um our real show will be back proper. I was wondering if I was going to London or not, so then now I know I don't have to, or I could. Yeah, you're you're, you're safe for February, don't worry. If you do come over in February, of course, you know, we'll have to take you out and find you something to drink. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll be fine. Good. Hey, hey, Billy, so speaking about, uh, you know, coming over and whatnot, uh, I'll be out there in uh, December, mid-December, before the Christmas period. You plan on bottling anything special mid-December? Uh, we're not. However, we have turning up any day now uh, some new signatory bottlings. Um, I will. I, okay, I I will tell you what these are. I haven't told anybody else this publicly yet what they're going to be. Um, where are they? So my exclusive bottlings thing. So we have coming from signatory. We have a heavily sherry Belek in two thousand and three, uh, eighteen year old. Uh, we have a Kalila 2010 11 year old and then we have a couple of interesting things uh, we have a 21 year old 2000 vintage Capadonic heavily peated oh, wow. and this is the really interesting one we have a 1997 24 year old liquid heavily oh. peated so heavily peated That's liquid good, is, is not wow. a thing I've ever tried before and uh, which I am very very keen on trying when it turns up hopefully next week so uh, yeah, they're literally going to be landing. Oh, it says here arrival week commencing eighth of November, which shows you quite how uh, reliable Signatory are at delivering stuff on time. Uh, a colleague of mine promises me he put the order in last Wednesday, so hopefully it should be with us next week. Is there heavily peated liquid, heavily peated Capadonna. Will they be exclusive to whiskey exchange? Yeah, they're they're bottled, they're single cast oh. bottles just for us. So yeah, they'll be turning up. I have no idea on price. The boss hasn't tried them yet. You know, they, they literally, we're just waiting for Signature to send them. We've been waiting for six months. I mean, he's been told real soon now, real soon now, uh, but we'll have those uh, before Christmas. So, um, and I'm thinking, I don't know how many bottles we've got of each of them yet, but you know, they might be around when you're visiting. But um, yeah, if you're in London, make sure you pop down the shops and, yep. and have a nice chat with them. And if you're coming over, if you give them a call, they might be able to hold things for you as well. They think about that. Yeah. Um, yeah. London in mid December. You're mad. <laughs> uh, it, 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 a wedding in North, uh, wedding in North England, Edinburgh for a few days, Speyside for a few, uh, Christmas with my parents in Belgium. Okay. That sounds a lot better. There we go. Yeah. yeah. That definitely works. Well, that's a good plug for the whiskey exchange. You also have a, what is it a golden bottle lottery so of course if anybody orders from the whiskey exchange you have a chance to win something really cool I yeah it's, it's basically every every day or so we basically just ran around ran a ran a run a random number generator an order is picked and someone goes and pops a, a gold wrap bottle worth like somewhere between a couple hundred quid and a couple of thousand pounds in, into your box so we got a couple of those left um we've got a couple we got one day sale coming up shortly although we haven't announced it yet but we have that every year we have a, a spirit and a whiskey that go on really good deal for a day we have a day where everybody gets freebies in their parcels you know we, we've got lots of stuff coming up over you know the next sort of like bit coming into christmas 
um yeah and in our shops we, we've got a thing where we're getting ready to do like a, a, a guess the number of minis in the jar you know like you know, guess the number of beans in the in the jar we've got huge tanks full of samples of whiskey and it's guess how many minis are in there so we're, we're just in the process of trying to fill enough miniatures to fill them because we realize they hold a lot more than we thought um, a lot more than we thought so uh yeah who, who knew that a 40 centimeter a 40 centimeter cube could hold a lot of uh these so but yeah there's lots of cool things coming up over christmas time um i've got a load of writing to do we've got a load of uh, blog posts that are going up uh, we've got our whiskey of the year our gin of the year and our rum of the year coming soon as well i need to have a chat with the folks who've won gin of the year i'm just trying to organize that at the moment we're voting on our whiskey of the year next week on wednesday so we'll be announcing that on the first of december um yeah it's this is the busy season absolute carnage uh, all the time so uh and on top of that I just launched a book so you know it's uh, and that's nothing to do with the whiskey exchange that's just in my spare time i currently uh, organize that just before this tasting um i was finalizing the lineup for two tastings i'm doing first two weekends of december at whiskey shows in the north of england in scotland where i'm going up to do tastings to promote my book and then sit on a table and sign them so you know it's all go it's all go well whenever you come to the states let us know we can set up a really nice tasting as well we'd love to have you and um, if everybody has any kind of final questions, start thinking about those and get those ready. Um, and, and Billy, I think you had like some trivia questions that would be. Yeah. So, so um, James about was sort of saying that, yeah, maybe, maybe we should do something trivia-y before the end. I've, I've got a few questions. I, I've probably got too many questions. I, I try to chop loads of them out, but so what, what, what are we doing with prizes and things? Yeah, so whoever, I think it's just one winner. I don't know. There's nothing. I think um, just, just one winner. Personally curated book from a personally signed with whatever message you, I guess, whatever message with some limitations <laughs> from you, Billy. So, oh, oh no, no, no. I, I'm, I'm totally mercenary on this. Front. I'll, I'll write anything. Don't worry. Okay, so literally write or, or draw anything. <laughs> so, well, draw, draw is going maybe a stage too far. My ability to draw is very minimal. Yeah, don't worry. So, one, I, one winner. Um, winner take all and uh yeah so we'll work that out it will take a couple of weeks to get to you but uh we'll coordinate and get it all but um yeah billy by all means so first things first this, this is my lovely book um it's it's only a little it's only a little book uh but now um the british library who are uh, one of the other uh, libraries in the world that get a copy of every single book published um they commission <laughs> some books and uh they have a, a small range of, of different books with lovely different colors all started from this one uh, the philosophy of beards uh this is, is uh, well? so this is not my book unfortunately this is a uh this is a reprint <laughs> of an 1850s lecture uh from a guy called thomas uh, thomas gowing who felt that if a gentleman didn't have a beard then he was showing a moral failing and it's an entire book about the moral failings of men without beards there's a whole section in there about how women don't have to have beards but you should be proud of a beard if you do have one and are a woman it's a very very strange book um but yeah, so they decided that it was so successful, they decided to commission a load more. So there's gin and wine and coffee, and they asked me to write about whiskey. So it's a little book. It's all about the history of whiskey around the world and how it all ties together, mainly. And it's all about tying together the ideas of whiskey. And it's, it's basically a beginner's guide to whiskey, but not. It's a beginner's guide to the history and understanding of what whiskey is. There's a bit about how to drink whiskey in there. It's a bit about how to make cocktails and things like that, you know, because... They said, could you put the normal things in? And a little bit about what's coming in the, in the future. But the main thing is the British Library has got one of the best archives of pictures in the world. So it's just packed with lots of very lovely sort of pictures from, i oh, try and find, uh, from around the world of whiskies, everything from sort of old adverts through to uh, in the section all about prohibition, because there's a whole load of stuff about prohibition, of course. Loads, loads of lovely uh, pictures from uh, the, the, the time of US prohibition. My God, who the hell's that in the background? Right. So, <laughs> trivia quiz things. So, I, I, I will trust you all not... I'm about to say, I'm trusting everybody not to cheat, but now there are prizes on the line. So, I am going to... Wait, where's my spreadsheet? Don't I have questions? Right. We shall... Oh, no. Here's... Right. So. I got, sorry, I've got too many spreadsheets open. One of them has got a whole load of lineups for, for tasting someday. Right. So... I have got anything. I'm going to chalk out some of these because I've got too many questions. Uh, I also I have a tiebreaker question as well at the end and everything. 
Are people so, calling out, or do you want them to write it down in the chat? If you write, if you write, write it down on a piece of paper. I, I, I will trust you all not to cheat. Strangely, so grab, grab yourself so, or, or a word document or something like that. And I need to now work out. So I've got some. Ah, here we go. These are the ones which are actually all about. Yeah. So first things first. Okay. Are, are we ready, everybody? Okay. Nodding heads. People have got pens. All is good. Right. So, what year did the Whiskey Exchange Whiskey Show first happen? No googling. Okay, right. On to okay, the four distilleries we tried tonight. So four of them. Oh yeah, the four distilleries we tried tonight. Ardbeg, Ben Nevis, Ben Harvin, and Glen Farkless. Which one of those theoretically has the highest yearly output? Which one of those can produce the most whiskey a year if it wanted to? All right, all got one? Yeah, yeah, good, right. So who owns... Ben Nevis Distillery. Right. Okay, I missed out that one. I miss That's boring. That's the same as the last one. Right. What is the name? Actually, no, I don't know the right name. I'm going to get rid of that one. So, what country? Do the current owners of Bunnahaven come from? And that's ignoring any recent deals which might claim they might be owned by the Dutch or the Belgians. That hasn't happened yet. I'm very, very sorry there to, you know, to, to not know which country Heineken's from. It's Dutch, isn't it? No, it's not. Yes, it is. It's good. I'm very sorry for insulting Belgium then by associating Heineken with it. Okay, good. That's right. Okay. Uh, how many years as of this year? Has Glen Farkless been open? I mean, is that okay? I'll ask one one more general question, and this is my favorite, my standard favorite sort of whiskey question: Which country in the world drinks the most Scotch whiskey by volume in total for the whole country, not per head, and that the country itself? Which country drinks the most Scotch whiskey? Right. Are we, are we ready for answers and things? Anybody still? Anybody, any questions repeated? Pens down. <laughs> I, don't, I have my type. He does type. Are, are we ready? Ready for this? All right. The Whiskey Exchange Whiskey Show started in 2001. Year 2009. My first whiskey show I went to was in 2010. Despite the fact I went to a load of the introductory events in 2009, nobody told me at them they were for a show. So I missed the show so I didn't know it was happening, even though I went to the promo events. It's very annoying. I went to the 2010 one, got very drunk, and I've worked at everyone since. Anyway, uh, what was the next question? Oh, yes. Which just there is the highest theoretical yearly output? The answer is Glenn Farkless. It's Glenn Farkless. I thought it was Bunner as well. Then I checked my, the, uh, the yearbook, and it's actually Glenn Farkas. Glenn Farkas has a theoretical output of three and a half million litres of alcohol a year, which it does. Bunner Harvin produces about two and a half, but could produce 3.2, because they are absolutely massive, but don't actually produce as much alcohol. But unfortunately, Glenn Farkas is even bigger. bigger. Peter, I had exactly the same thing. It was only because I checked the whiskey yearbook hiding up here um, 10 minutes before we started that I realised you got it wrong. I just, I just thought that, you know, we talked about Buna a lot, about their yeah. output and whatnot, and it kind of threw me off. Ah, you see, it's all, all, all the blind. So great questions. So, anyway, so who owns Ben Nevis? Nika. Nika, indeed. So it's owned by Japanese whiskey distiller Nika, which if you've heard lots of the recent stuff about the revelations about what's actually in bottles of Nika whiskey, you may not be entirely surprised by <laughs> Many comments about how uh, Nika from the barrel is uh, obviously Ben Nevis from the barrel. Anyway. Um, There's a Japanese distiller. <laughs> um, so what country do the current owners of Bunnahaven come from? South, South Africa. 
South, South Africa. Africa. <laughs> yeah. South so Africa. the current owners of Bunnahaven are Distel. Distel are the largest uh, booze company in South Africa, and they have just about been acquired by Heineken in the last week or so. So they're sort of almost owned by the Dutch, but not quite. But they're still South African for now. I heard they're splitting the company and not selling the or that the whiskey part is not going to go to Heineken. This is the thing: There's, the whiskey part That's is going to split off into a separate company, but it looks like it's going to be a wholly owned subsidiary of Heineken, maybe. Yeah. But there's it, been. I was reading the reports the other day, and it's, nobody can tell which it is. And on the Bunnahaven website, they're very confused. It's not, uh, the Distel website is all very confused as well. We shall see. I hope it doesn't go to uh, to Heineken. Heineken are my second least favorite company in the world. Maybe the Endeavor the first. The um, website does ship to the US and is actually really nice because you can buy a bunch of stuff. But shameless plug. Yeah. We'll see how we go. Anyway, right. How many years has Glen Farkas been open as of this year? One eighty five. 185 it's their 185th anniversary this year yeah. and they celebrated by releasing a 185th anniversary whiskey of which i have a sample somewhere and i've just realized i've lost it and i need to write tasting notes um, oh no that's a different one i've got way too many glen right um they're 185 this year um the grant family haven't owned it for all of that but they've owned it for almost all of it since they bought it for a tiny sum of money many years beforehand and final one, what country drinks the most Scotch whiskey by volume? India. Japan. It is France. France. Uh, France. The US drink the most by value, uh, to the point of the value being more than double that of France. But the, the French drink more by volume by a significant proportion more than the USA. They drink a lot of cheap blended whiskey no, in, I in France. A lot of cheap blended whiskey. Uh, and also, they don't drink anywhere near as much cognac as everybody else around the world does. <laughs> the French don't drink cognac, they drink Scotch whiskey. Right, so what do we get then, everybody? A maximum of eight points. I got zero. <laughs> I got three. <laughs> you got six. Wait, how would the... You only had six <laughs> questions. <laughs> oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry, six questions. Yeah, I can't count. I have two at the beginning there, which I didn't ask you. Yeah. There we go. Uh, three. Those are gone got, so six questions. I got three. Got three. three. Matt got three. Three. I got zero. Three. Mallory. Okay, we got three. We got three threes. Anybody else got more than three? Yeah, I got a couple close though. Olaf, Olaf. Mallory, Peter. I guess it's a tie. Right. right. I have three. I have a tiebreaker. All right. Matt. So my tiebreaker question it is: um, Every year at the whiskey show, I have very, very stupidly put out a list of all of the drinks that are available in the week beforehand so people can plan what they're going to drink so this is all the things we are told this is not the actual list of things that is definitely there because people bring different things sometimes like that but on this year's dram list which is a list of all the whiskies and other spirits and other drinks that we were told about beforehand how many drinks were on that list so it's closest Closest person wins on this one. I actually downloaded it, but at the time, so I have seen it. Forty-four. I have to look it up today, and I, I have given you a, a rough estimate of the sort of number. I'm going to say two hundred and seventy, two hundred and seventy-five. Two seventy-five down there. Okay. I said Anybody else? Forty-four. I said two forty-four. Two forty-four. Five eighty. How many? Five hundred eighty. You're, you've all underestimated. I did tell you it was about a thousand. I said thousand. Who? James, who's in your. <laughs> see, don't listen to them. You see? Oh. So. 580 and one penny. The actual number this year was 986. Last year, we broke a thousand. I think it was about a thousand and four we hit um, the last in person year before this year, but it was 986. Which means who who I said five eighty. But but you didn't but you didn't get you, you went in. Yeah, I had three. No you're, you're three, you're it. Oh. That means that actually like they both get a prize. Give it to the <laughs> person. Oh, who's, yeah. who's getting one anyways, and so like you know Wait, you know. are you telling me Matt was just smoking a cigar on your patio? <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't actually see your phone, Matt. So that, that lets you prove nothing. But I will let you guys. I will let you guys decide amongst yourselves who has won and all that sort of thing. I'll, I'll leave that with you, James, as the arbiter of all things. 
Yep. You know, fantastic. And anybody that wants to buy a book and have it signed by Billy, contact me. You have my info and we'll throw in the order so you can save on shipping or whatnot. But so yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting yeah. at the moment on stock because, um, yeah, I, I don't, if anybody saw my Instagram story today, uh, it was just a gigantic pile of books and a pen. Uh, because uh, at a dinner last week, I just got all my new stock in. I was like, brilliant. I've got enough books on my website to sell until Christmas. And then somebody walked up to you at this dinner and went, hi, can I have half your stock? <laughs> and uh, unfortunately, I couldn't really say no because it was somebody from McAllen. So, um, yeah, so uh, I will have some more in a couple of weeks time and it should hopefully be able to get over to you before Christmas. Awesome. Yeah, we'll, we'll be in touch. We'll, we'll, we'll buy it. We'll, we'll, we'll be on the, the lookout. Um, well, this is fantastic. Of course, anybody that has any last minute questions, I ask you guys, they think about if you have any. Billy, do you have any questions for us as, you know, people that live in the U.S.? Uh, we buy a lot from the Whiskey Exchange. Some of us have been to the Whiskey Show. Some of us haven't. Do you have any questions about kind of us and what we're doing here? We'd love to just be able to be helpful in any way. Yeah. If you ever had any thoughts like, what are they doing over there across the pond? Like, what, 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 why are they doing this? Do you have any questions for us? Not, not really. I think so. I, I, I chat with folks in the US who are whiskey fans all the time. It's one of the great things about the, the wonders of the interwebs and all that sort of business, you know, is that I get to see this sort of thing happens, you know. It, it's a long time since I've been isolated from chatting with you know, US whiskey fans because we're all sort of just so connected these days. It's, it's really nice and easy to be able to chat with everyone. But the thing I always sort of say, you know, the other side of it is, you know, if you ever need anything from us, because, you know, I, I talk to folks all the time about whiskey all over the world so i'm just used to it you know i'm suspecting you guys don't although yeah maybe a few you talk about as much about whiskey as i do but at the same time you know it's it's any questions you have anything you want to know just drop me a line i'm always around i'm seemingly always online as well which is definitely a problem um i need to really think about my life but anyway um you know if you uh, if you have any questions drop me a line uh, you can find me on facebook and things like that i'm billy at the whiskey exchange i'm billyabbott.co.uk you can find my website um i have lots of weird names on social media uh, so you may not be able to find me so easily there I, i'm meat robot on instagram i'm cowfish on twitter um cowfish was my name on the internet since 1997 um there's a restaurant in uh, in charlotte um called the cowfish sushi burger bar and i've been redirecting messages on twitter for them since they started <laughs> because i've been called cowfish longer than they've existed so yeah um if you ever ever want nothing about whiskey ever want to chat about whiskey just drop me a line and if you're ever in london give me a shout and i shall point you in the right direction and if i'm around i shall meet up and buy you a beverage um you know i i uh, i'm always looking for an excuse to uh, have a dram somewhere in london um and also beyond so now if I can ever ever help out, just give me a shout. Oh, and if I'm new, if if I ever make it to New York again, you will hear from me. Don't worry. Sounds so, good. Yeah, yeah. Anybody last minute questions? Any well, thank you, Billy, so much for joining us. I know that you took the majority of your Sunday night. Thank you so much. Um, super helpful. I mean, I think I always say like you come into a whiskey tasting with five little drams and you leave with a dozen new friends. So a lot of pe people here, we know each other, but we also get to see each other maybe face to face the first time. Other people, we've kind of spent a lot of time together and others might not have joined a lot of these and have been able to learn a lot from you and just from these great whiskeys. And so thank you so much. Can't wait to do it again. We'd love to have you as well. So um, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, Cheers. cool. Thanks a lot, guys. I'd sure. just be sitting around just like getting bored otherwise, you know, watching Cowboy Bebop and being disappointed. So, you know, you saved me from all of that. So thank you very much. I'm always proud of rescuing you from the soccer that day. You know? I, I lived down, I don't know if I, I told you before, Matt, I lived down the road from Wembley Stadium. I literally can see it out the window at the moment. It's a Wembley Stadium, you know, big you know, soccer stadium here in London. I have no interest in football whatsoever. And I spend a large amount of my time directing people to Wembley because you can see it in the distance from just outside my house. So people get off the train and they sort of go, oh, how do I get to Wembley? It's like you get on the bus. Well, I can see it. It's like, yeah, it's really big. It's a long way away. It's just, oh, dear. But yeah, you, you, you save me from these sort of things because otherwise I have to vaguely pay attention because people ask questions. And the excuse of, sorry, I was doing a whiskey tasting, that one works. Anyway, chaps, I shall leave you to it. I, uh, yeah, I need to go and find myself a beer. Oh, no, sorry. Yeah. I need to go and do, you know, tidy the kitchen. Yeah, that. And find myself a beer. Thanks, Billy. Thanks, Billy. Cool. Thank, Thank you. you. Hey, great. Draw me a line if you ever need anything. Uh, and I'll speak to you all sometime soon, I'm sure.
See you guys. Thanks, Bye. 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 B